You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Well, we are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode. And we have a lot to talk about. There's a lot going on. Impeachment wrapped up today. State of the Union last night. Iowa on Monday. I got a new car. The Super Bowl. Rush Limbaugh. Like, it's old school Walden episode. We have no show notes. A million things that we want to talk about and no plan. So stay tuned and see what actually gets covered. We'll find out next. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Oh, I don't know what I said. Oh. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Hey, that's me. It is so nice to be with you. We have a lot going on. Harry is not here this week. He had some family commitments that he had to to do, I promise you. Harry will be back. Uh, But with me is someone who will be here, uh, if you can't tell, somewhat... um, Semi-permanently. Yeah, I don't, I don't know live stream. I think maybe it just is bad internet. Let me turn off my phone. So we live stream. So if you're a Patreon member, then uh, we live stream this to the Facebook group. So we can have a, a nice little chat with our Facebook people. I don't know where my phone is. So my weak, my weak-ass Wi-Fi, you have to turn your phone off to make sure that you can get, to, get a good signal. So uh, maybe it'll come back. Uh, anyways, the internet here at the broadcast headquarters is not quite up to snuff. It is, uh, I think, R- Reinhold is with me uh, in here on a more semi-permanent base- basis, if you haven't noticed, um, because I like arguing with him. Um, if you're a left-leaning person, then you'll probably like Reinhold. If you're more right-leaning, you'll probably like me. And if you're just a uh, burn-it-all-to-the-ground nerd, then, you know, Harry's for you. Um, Reinhold, my provider is Iowa Incorporated Internet. So... <laughs> I'm, uh, the state of Iowa actually runs a line to my house, and for some reason, the internet's not working here. I don't know what's going on. Well, now I don't hear well, did you. Have, did you Hello? have the DNC coded for you? No, nope, I don't hear you at all. Oh, see, this, the, this Iowa internet. Can you not hear me at all? Oh, I know what I – it's not the internet. It's me. I had you muted on the board. <laughs> oh, so, so this time it wasn't me muting and forgetting to unmute okay no 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 no. make sure it does it doesn't always happen to me and harry no this is my unprofessionalism i faded down and then uh didn't turn you up (laughs) this is why i need a producer this is why i need an intern this is why i need a lackey i need somebody that i can boss around to do this stuff for me i'm i'm much too busy watching impeachment and so twos and in and super bowls to do the show well all right this is off to a great start uh reinhold thanks for being here how are you doing i'm doing well it's been a a long week i'm coming down with a bit of a a cold i'm trying to fight off and i've been dealing with a migraine all day but other than that i'm doing great (laughs) i have i i wasn't we weren't live last week i had ran a pre-recorded episode because i just was not um I, i was really sick like i had bad cold and I have a very sensitive voice. So something happens to me every February where I, late January, early February, I get a cold and then I get laryngitis. And you can kind of hear into my voice. I've got a little bit of like a, a Henry Kissinger thing going on here in my voice. And I was just like, I can't push it this week. And Reinhold's like, there's a lot going on. I'm like, I know, but we'll do this instead. And so I feel, I felt well enough. I feel fine. It's just, you know, the drainage. And so... Here we are, but hopefully you don't get laryngitis, you don't get sick, you don't get the flu. That's going around. Yeah, that's been going around a lot with the people I work with and trying to avoid as much of that as possible. How many pandemics do we need to survive before we just not buy into the bullshit of like coronavirus and pig flu and avian flu? Like, 
this is like the eighth pandemic where we're all going to die and like 2,000 people in China have it and 14 people in the United States have it. And somehow uh, it just it just shows you the power of the free press and propaganda in a free society. Like everybody's panicking and shutting down access to China and crashing their stock market over 2,000 people in China. Like that's 0.1% of the Chinese population were freaking out about it. And it's about the same uh, transmission rate as regular flu, and it's not that much worse. It's really just the flu with some different things in it that they don't they don't know what it is, you know. So like they weren't prepared for it. That's the real key: is that the they have to guess every year on the flu virus uh, to say, okay, we think it's going to be this type of flu virus, and then they send it out and get everybody the inoculations against it. But if it turns out that some other strain some other strain goes through, then you're not going to um, uh, be prepared for that. And that's when it kind of kicks in. And it's always worse for elderly people and younger people too, because their their systems aren't really re- able to handle it as, as well as everybody else is. So there are going to be people who die from it, just like there's people who die from the flu. I don't know if it's that big of a concern right now, other than just people aren't prepared. It, right. It's not going to hit you. It's like Ebola. If you lived in Africa, Ebola was scary. But I do. I did notice when I because I had to go to the hospital from time to time, which is where I always get sick at. Right. So right. ten days after going to the hospital uh, for doctor visits with my wife, I get uh, we both end up getting sick every time because I, that's just a breeding ground. But they always ask. You know, they're always asking us, "Were you out of the country recently? Have you been to China recently?" Is what they're asking now, just because they can, you know. <laughs> Make sure you're not going to get everybody there sick. I'm like everybody's going, everybody here is getting sick. So I, I don't I don't mention the show I work for just because I don't want them to have to be associated with this uh, this program and my opinions because they're very 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 apolitical. Um, but I work at a radio show and the the main host is very germaphobic, and we had a comedian in who had been to China ten days previously. So it was a couple days ago, and he had just come back from China. So they all joked about, you know, the coronavirus. And the guy goes, well, it's funny you mentioned it. Did you hear about that uh, cruise ship that's quarantined in Italy? Yeah, that was the ship that I, I departed from in Italy. And then the, the next cruise, they quarantined it. And you would have thought, uh, like, it was like Dustin Hoffman was walking through in the suit from, a, from Outbreak. Like, it was just everybody was wiping things down everywhere. Like, it just is so funny to me how people fall for these – for these, uh, like, these, pan- these media-induced panics that aren't real. They're just there to get you to watch the news. And you should just not click on the story. It's not that big of a deal. Unless you have it, then it's a big deal. But otherwise... Yeah, well, it's like anything, as, as long as you're not... If it's something that only affects a very, 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 very small point percentage of the population, then the odds of you getting it are, are kind of really kind of silly to, to be concerned about. Um, but you want to make sure that if you, if it, you do end up with something like that, that you've got people who can take care of it for you. So, uh, by the way, I was looking for my phone so I could turn off the Wi-Fi, and, uh, the phone was in front of my face and I was reading the comments on the cell phone from the Facebook group that was sucking up the Wi-Fi that was causing the problem streaming. And so, yeah. I get up, I just walk away, make you pad and talk about a virus that you may know nothing about that we didn't prepare for. So I could go look for my cell phone so I could turn the Wi-Fi signal off. And I'm like, I don't know where I put it. I cannot find it. And I look and I go, oh, it was sitting here in front of my face the whole time. Is this boomerism? You're a boomer. You yes. tell me. It, well, I'm not a boomer, but yes, it is boomerism. So the, uh, your eyeglasses are on your head right now too, in case you're right. looking for them. Yeah, you know, right. that sort of thing happens. My wife has done that before where she's put her her glasses up on our top of her head and then can't find them. It's <laughs> like, honey, they're right there. Now, she has an excuse. She's been through a lot of chemo and, and everything else. So we give her a pass on some I've of that I've been stuff. through the meme wars. <laughs> I mean, I was within the meme wars of 2016. Does that, does that help give me? Well, a- I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a status there, right? So you have, to, you have to file and make sure you have – you can go to the uh, Meme <laughs> Veterans Administration. <laughs> VA. Right. For my sick burns. Um, yeah. So 
I don't know where, where do you want to start? So our, our choice is we could start with, all right, let's start. Look, we're talking about light, stupid topics. So let's start with the Super Bowl briefly. Every year we have this stupid, because I got a lot to say to you people. I've been off for two weeks. I'm pent up. Every year we go through this exercise. The Super Bowl halftime show is perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It may not be your taste, but America is a big place, right? We have black people. We have Jewish people. We have men. We have women. We have white people. We have conservatives. We have Democrats. We have country-loving people. We have urban people. Not every show that they play in is going to be for you. You might like the halftime show with the classic rock guys. You might like the Beyonce. I personally, my favorite in recent memory has been Beyonce and Coldplay and Bruno Mars. I thought that was great. But just because the halftime show was not programmed specifically to you, it doesn't mean that it sucked. And every year we get this thing where everybody gets on social media before the stupid thing's even over and talks about how shitty it was. Well, this year was great. We got a booty off between J-Lo and Shakira. My high school self was going nuts. Uh, but it was a perfectly fine halftime show. Did you watch it? I did not watch it or much of the Super Bowl. Okay. Well, as, it as was someone my age, I fell asleep in the middle of it. <laughs> It was it was started at six. It wasn't that late, Grandpa. I woke up at the end when the celebration was going going on, so that was that was telling. <laughs> so I could watch the Mass Singer because that was a much better show, in my opinion, a better uh, excitement level. All right, okay. Well, <laughs> the, the the halftime show was basically for those who didn't see it. It was Shakira came out, and then J Lo came out, and J Lo's little kid sang in in a bridge or something. And it was very Latin focused. Uh, J-Lo is from the Bronx, Jenny from the Bronx, but I believe she's a Puerto Rican heritage. I think Shakira is Lebanese and Colombian, I believe. Uh, and there were several Latin artists singing in Spanish and, you know, Pepsi and the NFL and Fox and everybody else is going, hey, the demographics of this country are shifting and there's a significant amount of people that might like to see themselves represented in the Super Bowl. And Puerto Rico is a state, almost, might as well be. Um, oh, you'd, you'd be having trouble explaining that to a lot of people who think that they're yeah. foreigners. and Maybe shit. talk right more into that mic for me. Yeah. So, but, yeah, yes. The fact is, is that Puerto Ricans are Americans, and uh, they pay taxes like you and me. They're just not a state. And they have been pretty much shit on by our government after Maria the hurricane devastated their island. And when I look at this stuff, I go, okay, I am a white male Christian. I'm a libertarian, but I live a conservative lifestyle. I am middle class. I am pretty much as, if you believe in privilege, I am as privileged as it gets, right? Like I, I'm doing pretty well for myself and I don't have to really think about a lot of different factors in society. And pretty much when I turn on the television, most everybody kind of looks like me, talks like me, is programming to me, and okay. But when somebody programs to a segment of our population that isn't me, I don't freak out about it. Because I may not have liked Shakira, but a 29-year-old Latin girl deserves to have entertainment too. You know, like, but even if it weren't about immigration and Latinas dancing, it's also, it didn't matter who it was. Like if Maroon 5 came out and had a perfectly fine Maroon 5 type concert, everybody shits on it. Paul McCartney, oh, that was the worst one ever. You know, The Who, oh, what a horrible show. It's like the easiest, stupidest little brain take. Everybody's trying to be edgy by complaining about something that everybody's watching. It doesn't make you look smart hating things that people enjoy. Like it just doesn't. Like let people have their fun. You don't need to shit on it. It wasn't a bad halftime show at all, but literally everybody, and I said it before it was even over. I go, here comes our national uh, nightmare, which is everybody saying the Super Bowl sucked when it was fine. And this one was a great halftime show, but a lot of people felt that way. And wouldn't you know, like my Facebook, the Facebook friends of a lot of my Christian friends, and, and it hasn't started. It's like it starts in a slow roll 
one person kind of goes, you know, it, it just seemed inappropriate to have that sort of gyration in front of children. And now four or five days later, your Facebook feed, if you're a liberal atheist in Chicago, you're starting to see it now in your Facebook feed from your aunt going, I just think we need to protect children from leotards and gyrations and pole dancing. Like crotch shots is what I was told. So I don't know if you heard about this, but there's a guy who's wanting to sue the NFL every year. There's one of these for, years. for $300 trillion because the N, the NFL has made it hard for him to enter the kingdom of heaven. Really? Yeah. He, he says, well, they tell me I shouldn't watch it. If I don't want to watch it, don't watch what? it. But they didn't tell me I was going to be watching that. I thought I was watching a football show. So I didn't know that this horrible stuff was going to be coming on. And now it's going to be harder for me to get into the kingdom of heaven. So he wants to sue for $300 trillion. I just hate these people. Like, I know these are sort of my people, but come on. Like, there's nothing that they were doing that NFL cheerleaders don't do. Chris Galt, founding host of this show, is one of these people who was just tormenting, tormenting women on my wall, <laughs> basically calling them harlots because they liked the gyrations. Was like, there I a just, huge oh, outrage? Was there a huge outrage last year when the guy was out with, like, no shirt on and no. all tatted up and everything? No. Read the subtext, right? Like, I, I'm, I just don't I, – you know, the people who support Trump who are okay with him grabbing her by the pussy and he's God's chosen one are sitting there mad that she pole danced at 50 years old in a bikini. Like, it, it wasn't even remotely inappropriate. Like, it, go watch a ballet. It's – scantily clad men and women dancing around and it's called art right i, I just don't I'm not saying that this was art it's a form of art they're doing something that R reinhold and i cannot do but it certainly didn't justify the outrage but it's like it, just pay attention to this stuff because it starts with like one person is outraged and then it builds to three and then it builds to nine and it just kind of all of a sudden four days after the super bowl you're going wait people have a problem with this because it starts on social media with some Karens who are complaining and then some blogosphere picks it up and goes, look at these Karens complaining. And then people go on and go, look at this article about Karens complaining on social media. And then the Karens on their Facebook go, I have to defend my fellow Karen. And then three days later, everybody's mad and fighting over some nonsense. And so it really is a product of social media that we're paying attention to this in any way, shape or form. It's stupid get over it oh yeah it is so, and, and the other thing too is that pole dancing is just because it has some association with um you know certain activities that some people may not appro appreciate um it takes a lot of work and training to be good at doing that you know i mean you don't have to do it in that aspect there's a lot of people no one do has it. a stronger floor than right. Reinhold. he has been working the pole for three weeks and his I have, pelvic floor is doubled. I do know life. people. I do know dancers, though, and I know what they go through to get that, to get that level of um, ability. So, you can tell when someone's been working at it and and they're really good at it. And they have a talent for it, right? And then there's there's then there's the other people who just kind of, you know, you do it because it's part of their job because of where they happen to be working at. Yeah. So that that's my gripe on the Super Bowl. I don't know if you have any thoughts around that. If not, we'll move on to Iowa. No, I think other than that, the it sounds like the uh, Super Bowl was a very entertaining one with a with a comeback win, and I was uh, glad that that happened, and we had a enjoyable time. Yeah, I'm I'm happy for the Chiefs. I mean, as a Colts fan, you know, 2006 or seven is today is actually the anniversary of 2007 when they won the Super Bowl. It was it was I was a Colts fan as a kid, and a lot of years when it was really horrible, and you know they they hadn't won a Super Bowl here. We had Peyton Manning and like. It was such a fun weekend after they won. When they won, after the week after with the parades and everything. Like, it was a great bonding moment for the city, and Kansas City hadn't been in it for 50 years. Andy Reid's a great coach. So I was, I was happy for Kansas City. I was rooting for them, you know, because it is a special thing when a small city like Indy or Kansas City can win it and, uh, and gets to celebrate. So congratulations to all of our Kansas City friends. Especially Austin Peterson. I know that Austin had nothing to do with the victory, but Austin is the only libertarian I know that lives in Kansas. So I just want to take this opportunity to congratulate him on the Kansas City Chiefs of victory. 
Yeah, I mean, it must be really feel, feel really great for the for the state of Kansas to be able to celebrate that. Exactly right. So to all our Kansans, thanks. Uh, we're we're happy for you. Um, so everybody in uh, Raquel, congratulations. I know she's from Kansas, so that was great. Um, now I have I have kind of said it briefly on the show in the past, but. I don't necessarily feel that my Libertarian Party work over the last decade did very much of anything except make me a lot of friends. Uh, and I, I just don't think I had a lot of impact on the power structure. And after realizing that there's not really a political party that kind of uh, is functional, that fits my uh, ideology, I just have kind of turned into the Heath Ledger Joker. I'm just ready to watch it all burn. I'm just ready to see it all go up in flames. I have never had more fun than Iowa night. It was so much fun. Like watching the Iowa caucus melt down and not have a winner and watching Wolf Blitzer cry. It was so much fun. I loved every second of it. And the whole next day and everyone panicking. Oh, it was so great. And then Trump coming out and having a state of the union and he did, he had a great speech and he, gave Rush Limbaugh a medal of freedom and like they're both smiling because they know they're trolling everybody. This is the greatest season of 2020 I've ever been a part of. I'm having so much fun so far. Uh, so it's just, everything's going great, but the Iowa caucus meltdown, I was just, I could not go to bed. I was so excited with how much of a cluster that was. It was really exciting. I'm not going to lie to you. I wouldn't want to be the Iowa caucus people or the shadow at people. But, man, as just somebody who doesn't have a dog in the fight, I was – uh, let's do it again next year. The only, only problem I have is that th – that I'm going to have coming out of that is that I do think there is a place for electronic um, voting as long as it's done right, as long as it's done with the right paper trail and backup and verification and everything else. So uh, Bitcoin, I think, comes in handy for that sort of thing. But – I'm, I think we need to get to that point. We're definitely not there yet, as we could see what happened the other night. Um, actually, yeah, so just, let me – It was let just me last, last yeah. night. No, no, no. Let me. It was two nights ago. Let me break Running it down night, for yeah. you. Yeah, and if you'll just pull that mic closer to you, it's just a mic technique thing. Um, yeah. So the Iowa caucuses are held, and it's not like a primary. So a caucus is not where you get off work for lunch, you go vote, you go back to work. A caucus is something that's different than a primary in that you show up to a gym essentially at like 8 p.m. I think it, the call time is 8 p.m. You show up to a gym. There is sections for the people that qualified to participate in the caucuses. So um, help me catch anybody that I didn't get. It was, it was Biden. It was Klobuchar. It was Yang. It was Sanders. It was Buttigieg. And it was, is that it? I, th I think Steyer, maybe. Maybe Steyer. Bloomberg was in there in some places. Well, well, Bloomberg didn't participate in Iowa that much. Okay. Or at all. He just avoided it. He's going to focus on the big states. Gotcha. And so you you go in this room and you have a, a bunch of seats. So you go to the – let's think of your typical high school gym and think of the bleachers. This section's Biden. This section's Yang. This section's whatever. And so you have your first round and everybody shuffles in. You go meet your team and you say, hey, I'm a Biden person. Nice to meet you. Cool. Um, and then they count everybody. And the threshold is 15% to go on to the second round. It's, it's basically runoff voting. And <clears throat> in a lot of places, Joe Biden, surprisingly, did not get the threshold vote. And so if you're a Biden person and you're in that room and you don't hit the threshold vote, you're with Klobuchar or Biden or Yang, and you don't hit that threshold vote, then you go to your second choice. And so you go, let's say you're a Biden person and you're like, can't do Bernie, man. I'm going to go over and I'm going to choose Pete. You know, or I'm going to go choose Warren. I forgot Warren. Um, you, you then have a second round of voting to see who wins that particular precinct. And the, 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 so what happened in 2016 is a lack of transparency. There, there has been a systematic set of problems with Iowa for many, many years. It's the first one in the presidential year every year, and then New Hampshire, and then Nevada, which snuck its way up a few cycles ago, and South Carolina, and then you have Super Tuesday. 
and that's on March 3rd. And that's so by my Super Tuesday, by the end of Super Tuesday, you usually have the nominee picked. The incumbent is definitely picked pretty early on. I mean, Trump is not going to face any opposition from Bill Weld. He got like 1.5% in the caucus, which is roughly 1.4% more than he'd get in a Libertarian Party caucus, I'm, I would imagine. Um, and so in, in, in like in 2008, uh, I forget what the, I don't think there was an, was there an issue in 08? I believe there was it with something uh, on the Republican side. In 2012, there was an issue where the vote totals were delayed. Rick Santorum won. Mitt Romney declared victory. Right. And then Santorum didn't get the bounce, and then he ended up not getting the nomination. Mitt Romney would get the nomination. Uh, in 20, um, 2016, Bernie and Hillary tied. And the Bernie people felt that they got screwed out of that because there wasn't a lot of transparency. And so what the Iowa people wanted to do this cycle was to give more transparency. The Bernie people especially were pushing that in Iowa. Hey, give us more transparency. So give us the data of who is their first choice when they walk in, who's their choice, who do they go to in the next round, and then who wins – and then there's another number with who gets awarded the delegates. And I don't quite understand the disconnect between the winner of the caucus and the delegates. Maybe you can explain that to me. But there is, yeah, yeah like it's, it's kind of confusing. And that's part of why there's a, long, a big conversation about killing off these caucuses altogether because there's there, Nevada and Iowa are caucuses and nobody understands them. And it's always, there's always delays and problems and, uh, there, there's really not because it's runoff voting and it doesn't quite look like election day. Almost never does Iowa select the nominee. It usually selects the person's second choice, which is what happened. Pete Buddha judge did really, really well there because he's everybody's kind of second choice. Like if you're a Biden person, you can kind of stomach Pete. If you're a Sanders person or a Yang person, a you're person. like a Warren person. Then you kind of like, He's everybody's second choice. It's why Huckabee won in 2008. It's, it's why now... Santorum. Yes. Now, it can be a killer if you're the front runner, if you're Jeb Bush, for instance, and you are the front runner for months and months and months, and you're, you go to Iowa and you place almost dead last with 1% of the vote, it could absolutely kill off a campaign. It doesn't usually select the winner. So it, does, it isn't significant in picking the winner. It's, in, it's significant in winnowing out because it, it's an important test of organizational strength. It's when everybody took Obama seriously in 2008 when he showed up and he blew the doors off of it against Clinton because everybody went, how did this guy do that? And that's when they started talking about his campaign's technology and his get out the boat efforts. And that, that was a significant organizational impressive moment for biden for for the 2020 race biden is somebody that is he's electable that's his selling point right and here's a guy who went to iowa which is a very old white state a lot of blue collar people the very voter that he is supposed to woo over to his side to defeat trump in a deep red state and he places fourth he really had no organization he did spend money there Yes, he was never really supposed to do well there, but the reality is getting fourth was going to be really bad for Joe Biden, except there was a lot of technology problem. The, the big important part of Iowa is that it gives you a bounce. So for a couple of days going into New Hampshire, everybody's talking about the media darling Pete Buttigieg and look how well he did. And wow, I can't believe Rick Santorum won. And I didn't know Mike Huckabee was even in the race. How'd he win? Or And so there's always a bounce that comes out of Iowa unless there's a problem, like in Santorum or Buttigieg's case. And so nobody, nobody's really focusing on how poorly Biden did and how well Buttigieg did. They're focusing on what went wrong. And what went wrong was a reporting error, basically. And so they, got, they, got, they tried to get fancy. And the way that they used to do it is you had the paper ballots, you'd send those in to the party. The parties run the election there, not the election division. Parties are party uh, primaries or caucuses are party functions. Here in Indiana, the taxpayers pay for parties to conduct private business. 
as a libertarian who is not party affiliated, I'm not supposed to vote in a Republican or Democratic primary by law. It's a class C felony because I'm not going to vote for the majority of that party's candidates in the fall. So that's how we effectively register people. Do I vote in primaries if there's somebody I really like or really hate sometimes? So, um, and here in Indiana, by the way, voting in a primary is when they get your data. And so if you want the data to drive out voters, you can only get Republican and Democratic data. You cannot get Libertarian, Green, Constitution, or Independent numbers because technically they don't record those numbers because those people don't vote. So it gives a, a data advantage to parties. But I'm paying the bills for Republicans and Democrats to conduct party business here in Indiana. We typically don't have problems. We did in 2007 with a primary um, with, with a Marion County Election Board not being able to open on time. Um, they had a catastrophic failure. But this does show you that if, if you do the same thing over and over and it's administered by county clerks and county budgets and state budgets, it's, it's a little more predictable and consistent than if the parties are running things. Uh, and so the, the state Democrats decided that they would set up an app. They would make the Bernie people happy, especially knowing that Bernie was gonna be a significant candidate in 2020. And so they decided that they would streamline the reporting process. And so everybody was gonna get an app. You'd report who was everybody's first choice, how many people are in those positions. You'd report everybody's second choice and you'd report the eventual winner, winning results. Well, you'd report that on the app. You'd put that into the app and send it up to the state party, and then they'd calculate all those numbers, and you'd have instantaneous data. And by 8.30, everybody would know. The caucuses are at 8, and we'll have a winner by 8.30 because everything's got to be so fast in this day and age. And so what happened uh, is that, well, Reinhold, do you want to kind of explain what happened? What, what went wrong with Shadow Inc.? And what went wrong with the app? Well, what went wrong with the app was that the coding was not up to snuff and it was reporting back partial information. It wasn't reporting back all of the data. If you so could they download couldn't pull. Huh? If you could even download the app. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was part of the problem, too. I mean, the, one of the reasons they wanted to have this app, too, was because with the, with the caucuses, the way they were run, if you showed up and you were in the area, in the room where they were doing the, the caucusing, not everybody in there was allowed to vote. So it was hard to get proper vote counts. And there was a lot of confusion where you, you would see 80 people in there, but only 74 were voting because the other six weren't supposed to, but you didn't know who they were. And you, you thought people were, you know, there was always assumptions that somebody was juggling the numbers, right? So that's always the big fear. So the, the app was supposed to take care of that, but it wasn't reporting back the data. It was, it was all kinds of a mess. A lot of people just didn't want to use it and chose not to use it. So, right. It wasn't a forced thing. So, uh, they were supposed to take their paper ballots and then enter it in for them on the, on the application. I think that's where the data disconnect ha probably happened. Um, so they were only getting partial data back. And so they're trying to pump numbers out that they had. They realize after they've already pumped numbers out to the media that those numbers are incomplete and not accurate. So they pull back and they ask the media to pull back too, because they say, Hey, you know, these aren't accurate numbers. And then that starts the conspiracy theories, right? They're all screwing Bernie. This is a, a a job to try to get Hillary back in. I mean, it was all kinds of stuff being said, and and, and there's a lot of Republicans who are just jumping on and piling on to this too, which you know it's fair for them to go for it. It's it's a feeling on their part. These are the people who want to run your health care, who want to uh, determine. Hey, hey, I went viral with that tweet. Okay, being I'm trying. To, yeah, being but you see. <laughs> Being libertarian and uh, Occupy Democrat Logic shared a tweet that I had where I said they want to run healthcare for 330 million people and they can't run an app for a caucus. Yeah. And uh, that, that was shared thousands of times. It's the first, it's, I, I haven't been this viral since I watched Jersey Shore. Right, but didn't uh, Rick say that a couple? Well, listen, Before the you. fact that Rick Irvine said it in the Facebook group and I copied it and made it my own tweet, I homesteaded it, is of no concern <laughs> of yours, okay? I, th yes, did I go viral on, on Rick's idea and observation? Yes. Was it under my name? Yes. That is the most important thing. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a, 
it's a funny kind of like, Hey, this is a horrible thing. And it, it throws up a lot of uh, issues, but it's also, when you think about it, it's a small state, less than 1% of the population lives there. It's not, it's not like a, a huge thing. It's going to be talked about for decades to come, but it is hilariously um, awful that they just, apparently they did no full state testing like Nevada. Nevada was going to use the same app. Yeah. They, they did full state. Yeah. yeah they, they did full state today. testing yeah. and verified everything was good, but then they saw what happened to Iowa and they said, Nope, we're not using that app. Yeah. We're, we're going, going back, back to paper. Way. Yeah. So, this is a company that, that developed it called Shadow, and Shadow was made up basically of Hillary Clinton operatives who started a tech company. They left. Uh, Robbie Moot claims he had nothing to do with the company, but several people, Intercept and, and others involved in the project are all saying, like, he helped get it off the ground. Like, he was, he was a part of this. Um, but Hillary Clinton tech people were behind the app. And they built it. And if you look at the LinkedIn, I saw a tweet of somebody that had kind of looked at the LinkedIn of the people that work for Shadow, the app developer. They're all like baby developers. They're like right out of college. I mean, they, they charged Iowa $63,000 to do this app. And I can tell you as somebody who has managed the projects of building apps, that's a pretty low number for a big project like this. Like it's a really low number. And that's what you get. And so that's my problem with a lot of like when people say we should have online voting, I go, no, we shouldn't because this is the, ex this is the rule, not the exception. You have a, a, a state or some bureaucratic or in, organ of the state that is contracting to build an app like this. The secretary of state's office finds the most well-connected person that wins the bid politically, not because of merit, but because they have the best connections then they shell out whatever budget was given to them by whatever legislative body deemed it necessary. And so you end up with a small amount of money going to well-connected political operatives instead of actual coders who know what they're doing. And the reality is a government, so somebody brought up online banking. This person is a Democrat and they're like, that's just a stupid argument because online banking is secure and that works. Well, online banking is attached to financial institutions, which last time I checked are the only sector of the economy that like are always doing well and doing gangbusters and taking a lot of my money. You know what I mean? So private organizations like a bank have the ability to be flexible with their capital. They have the ability to expand if they bring in more profit or move things around. They have the ability to have an ever increasing budget depending on how well they do because of profit. They also have the incentive to get it right. Exactly right. Because they can go out of business and never survive it. Shadow is out of business today and it will never come back. Those people who coded for it, those people who worked in it, those well-connected people are disgraced. Okay, that private company is out of business because of their bad service. A government institution like a secretary of state's office that contracts out the work or does the work itself will be dealing with limited budgets that are set by politicians who have competing interests, who want to fund other projects, who will nitpick the thing to death. And so you're never going to have the right amount of money. You're never going to have the ability to fully fund the technology so it becomes outdated. How many times have we heard all the nuclear <laughs> missiles are on floppy disks? Uh, how many times do you go into a government organization and see old ass computers look at the va and how behind they are in digitizing anything um and that is because of the constrained resources of a government institution and so you cannot turn over something easily hackable by foreign nations or domestic terrorists like james niece and, and put it into the hands of a bureaucratic institution with limited funds that doesn't have the flexibility to change and is bossed around by politicians. It's just never going to work. It will never succeed. And so this is not a one-time fluke. This is, the, this is how it will always operate. And my, my thing is that generations of Americans in specific locations have continually, multiple times a year and in, in often, show up to the polls to vote and to run elections. And the same volunteers train the next generation of volunteers. 
And so we have done this thing, this activity together, and have perfected it to the point that it works pretty damn well. And we don't need technology trying to make that more efficient. There really isn't a more efficient system out there than showing up to your polling place and voting in it. Like it just really isn't more efficient than that. Like it's, if you try to introduce new technology, the cost is too high to get the security right. $63,000 for an app that needed that level of security is an impossibility. It was always an impossibility. And if they had a team that had any concept of security and app development and the scale that they needed to operate at, they would have never taken the job. And they would have been able to communicate to the client that they weren't going to be able to deliver and you better figure out plan B. They were putting this app in the hands of precinct the, like people were finding out that night and downloading it. They didn't fully prepare. So it's, it's a fully, um, uh, it, it, it's just a silly, silly operation from, from top to bottom. Um, I, I actually, I, you know, it, it's, I, I'm partial to our election system and I'll tell you why, because I've actually gone and served at the polls. I've actually gone and worked at I've been an observer from the media in the main rooms and the count rooms. I've been a campaign worker on recounts. I've been a poll volunteer, poll inspector. I've worked multiple elections around vote counting in my local area. And what you learn is how efficient the system is and how well it does work. And all of a sudden, all these little conspiracies that pop up every year, you go, yeah, that's not how the system works. I know how it works. Like, just go volunteer, be a poll judge, and you'll know how it works too. Um, but they don't do that. They, they just want to nitpick and don't want to get involved. But election boards are desperate for volunteers. And so uh, th the system is fairly efficient and accurate for the amount of people that move through the system fully staffed by volunteers every single year for elections um, or three out of the four years here in Indiana. And so I am just not uh, partial to I've served, I've served on an election commission. I was on the Help of America Vote Act Commission. I was the swing vote on the HAVA Commission here in Indiana. We had a budget. We, we had been given by the Help America Vote Act. We had been given 13 mandates by the act, and they were funding two of them. And we had to do them but because the federal government said, if you want these funds, you've got to do these things. And so our job was to pick which two things we were going to fund, maybe three. And I was a big advocate on that commission for printable receipts. I take my receipt, you get a receipt, and you get my ballot, and there's a, a paper trail. Uh, and what I learned on that commission is how many things need to be done through the voting process and how many things need to be funded and how little money there is to do it and how little political will, will there is to actually fund that stuff, but how well it works despite those budget constraints. Because the American people turn out in millions on election day to volunteer at their local polls. And it's us that makes our elections run right. It's not Russians interfering. Don't let the Democrats lie to you. They're fucking lying to you when they say that your vote is compromised by Russians and hacking. It just isn't. It's not. I'm telling you. Right. Show up to your local polling place. Don't let people propagandize you. That's not happening. Don't fall for it. Um, but, I mean, I don't. I'm I'm not a person who's like the electronic machines. We I th we have we have the fill-in scantrons here in Marion County because we have millions of people or a million people in the county. But you know, in a rural county like you, a lot of times you have like the little touchscreen machines. I'm okay with those. Like those are pretty secure. Right. That, uh, yeah, that's that's technology that was right. not there. If you, I mean, when I and I was going to say okay, boomer on your on your whole discussion because the the idea that it's never going to happen, I think. Uh, you're playing in the wrong field there. It's the same as any agree. technology you're not, advance. You're not going to have a website that you can log in and, and vote and have it be completely secure. It just doesn't exist. The government it, it, cannot. One day. That. The, government, can. the government on its budgets cannot fulfill that level of security. They just can't. It's, it's not going to be done through the government. It's going to have to be private organizations implementing this at some point and they just adopt it. That's why it, it's never going to be like bleeding edge technology for the government, right? When I was first started voting, we still had the, the machines with the levers, right? right? You go in, you pop the levers, you pull the big one across and it records the vote and swings the curtain back, right? 
that was considered an advance, a, a, you know, a technology advancement from the paper ballots that they were doing. The problem with the paper ballots was, is they were easily manipulated. Um, like the first woman who ran for president, most of her vote totals were just dumped in the trash. They never got counted. So nobody knows how many votes she ever got. Um, the, the, the issues with Chicago and the voting in there and how you had more people voting than were alive and registered in this, in the districts. I mean, there's a lot of fraud and, and stuff that was happening. Um, now it wasn't like everywhere. It wasn't, uh, like a hundred percent or, you know, no, like uh, Lyndon, places, Lyndon Johnson in the thirties yeah. ran around and had, you had wooden boxes with padlocks on them and he just cut the padlocks and right. stuff ballot boxes. I mean, yeah, that stuff happened, but that's why we have the security now that we have. Right. And, and that's the thing is that they found a way to, to uh, counter that with technology, but it wasn't something that as soon as that technology was available, they implemented. Um, they waited until it was good and solid before it became the main way of doing it. Same way with the touchscreen, same way with the Scantrons. Those things came along later and they're great solutions, but if they were put in at the bleeding edge of things, it would have been manipulated too. I mean, there, there would have been problems. They wouldn't have had the funding. They would have had it done right. Security wouldn't have been done right. Now, we've got in the future coming, I mean, we've got a lot of different technologies that are happening and making available the option to have really secure electronic voting, but it's not there yet, right? So people are trying to do this thing. I know we talked about it in the Libertarian Party. We, uh, the last convention we went to, there was a problem because the voting was just taking so long to count. Right. And there was always errors with it. You know, oh, we got to double check this. Let's go back and recount those because we didn't count them right. And, and there was all this back and forth. So it took hours and hours to do what we could have done if we had an app like they were trying to do at the caucus. You could have, you could have gone to Diebold or you could have gone to a local company that supplies. I, I know the guy that I should have him on to talk about this. Right. He's like, why don't you just have the Libertarian Party of Indiana and the National Party contact me and they can just contract me to do voting machines. I'm like, you can do that? He goes, yeah, we don't just work with we work with organizations too, oh, yeah. you know. There, there have been people. There were people discussing doing that in the Libertarian Party. That I know, Mike uh, Michael Heights was big about this, and trying to get the uh, the Bitcoin community and all that stuff together. You know, crypto technology um, to do some of this protected stuff. And they were they were looking at organizations. Now we can't do that this next in the convention because it's got to be voted on before we can implement it. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we can go to this convention coming up in May and say, oh, we're going to do electronic voting. That's just not going to happen because that's not the way the, law, the bylaws work. But we can vote on maybe for the next one doing it. So I think the, the issue would be getting a sample of that app out to people, the voting thing, and seeing how it works, see how people like it, that sort of stuff. But libertarians have been notoriously against any kind of electronic voting because they're so afraid of security concerns but as a security guy i know that there are ways to do this we just haven't achieved it yet because of a lot of times government screw-ups so right yeah it's going it, i i don't think we're here yet and doing electronic voting at all i'm not for it especially for actual elections i mean a party I, election I is one like thing i'm not another. against the electronic touch machines that are specifically dedicated to voting i'm saying I don't think we're going to get to a point where you can log on to an app on election day and vote. And, and well, that would but be, the, but the app, it's a, it's the same thing. It's just what machine it's on. And, and if your con only concern is that those machines are controlled locally, by the, the party, locally, then you're giving yeah. up the control of that party to those machines. No, locally, locally networked machines that are basically computing machines versus cloud operated apps are two totally different things. I mean, the machines that are electronic that are in, they're not they're not beaming up to Amazon Web Services. They're mm. they're the information is being stored on the calculations within the machine. It's not the same as an app that is running Amazon Web Services. It's just not. Right, like, but you can have totally it. You can have an app that's not running on the cloud service. You can have it running on a local environment, but the app can still be running on a phone or a desktop somewhere. Yeah, but there's well, that gotta, isolation and stacker and and uh, all those different thing, technologies. Like I said, this is kind of what I do for a living is is secure technology and things like that. So no, there no, are no. ways to do nothing, this. I know nothing about what you do or how any of it works, but I'm telling you. My wife doesn't you, either. 
I'm telling you I'm an expert, even though I know nothing about this. Okay? <laughs> well, I'm, so, what I'm saying is that – Discussion over. I know, I, <laughs> we're going to get there someday. We're not there yet, uh, but I do believe we will get there. It, it's just a, a rethinking of some of the things that we're doing. So, like I said, it, for, for some minor stuff that we're doing, like caucuses or voting at the convention for – whether we want to have pizza for dinner or whatever. I mean, th those sorts of things are going to work them, work out the kinks and the bugs, and we're going to get to a point where we can do that. Uh, but I think it's 15 years down the road. Mr. Hopeful over here. So let's talk a little bit about the results. I have not seen updated results. Um, I, I can pull that up. But Buddha Judge took away a big win, um, and uh, Bernie Sanders came in close again. Iowa caucus route. Yeah, I think it was it was Buttigieg, Sanders, and then Warren and Biden kind of close together, but Warren was edged by doubt. Yeah, so those so, are the top four, but they were all like in the fifteen percent range. So you had to get fifteen percent in order to qualify for delegates. So I'm not sure what the total numbers were, whether he got fifteen percent enough to get delegates for Biden. But I know that um, when I last looked at it, Buttigieg had ten, Sanders had ten, Warren had four. So here no, it's updated. It's still. updated. Uh, Eighty-six percent reporting. Booted Judge with twenty-six point seven. Bernie with twenty-five point four percent. Eleven delegates between the two of them each right. get eleven. Warren with five at eighteen percent. Biden with no delegates at fifteen point nine. Klobuchar at twelve, and then Yang with one percent. Stayer at a point three percent, and nobody else getting any delegate votes. Um, and then on the Republican side. Trump won with 97.1%, 39 delegates. Bill Weld got one delegate with 1.3%. Joe Walsh, 1.1%. And then other candidates at 0.5%. Uh, so the turnout, it looks like, I don't know what the turnout is or if we know that for sure, but the Iowa caucus turnout on the Republican side looked like it was like 33,000. And 500 plus 500, well, it looks like it was like, Four thousand. <laughs> so I know oh, those numbers. Deep, those numbers are not really it just right. Can't, I, it can't be right. Yeah. Yeah, I saw um, like a hundred thousand, but it was or it was a larger number than than thirty thousand. I'm trying to remember what it was, but it was they weren't that far off of each other. Um, on number of people who had showed up. You tell me, but I honestly don't think that this means anything. I mean, it's good for Mayor Pete in terms of him kind of going, hey, you've got some organization, people take another look at him. But in reality, this was such a cluster that it doesn't get of a bounce to anybody. It'll be forgotten after New Hampshire. No, there's, there's a whole different set of rules going on now in this election that makes it different than other elections for the Democrats, mm -hmm. that it's going to be – it's not going to, it's not going to follow all the normal rules that you might be used to. Right. So uh, the problem with Biden is, is that his real big get uh, his popularity is surprisingly among uh, black voters. Uh, Pete is notoriously bad at black with black voters because of a lot of things he's done and said in the past that he hasn't made up for it. People. Yeah. Still and then it got leaked in Iowa that. when he gave his fake victory speech that sounded like Obama, he, purposely pulled anybody that was black out of the crowd like one lady came with her friends because they were pete fans they said hey can you uh come with us she didn't know what was going on ended up on stage behind mayor pete looking like he was like he had black supporters and yeah. she was so pissed that she got used as a pawn she went to the media afterwards yeah i mean that's the sort of thing that they've been trying to do they did something where they sent out an email and said this is our new pro new program that we're going to do to to uh address racial issues. If you agree with this proposal, uh, great. If not, let us know by four or we're going to use you as a, as a uh, support that you're giving your support to us. And they sent it out like at one thirty in the afternoon. And they said, if you don't hear back by four, we're going to just go ahead and say that you support it. Yeah. Right? He keeps getting called mayor cheat online. And I think it's hilarious. I don't know why, how yeah, he I mean, in Iowa, but hilarious. he's got issues, but the problem is he's also like the, the Biden Jr. I, I, I think he's more like Mike Pence and that he's just groomed himself for so long to try to get to this position. I agree. That, he that, doesn't that, really have core principles. Yeah. 
it, it, yeah, it's all just whatever he needs to do to make things happen. And some of the places he's worked are a little suspect and suspicious, but so ambitious um, that he's running as mayor of South Bend and he wasn't even a good mayor. We're in Indiana. Everybody up there says he was a horrible mayor and he thinks he can be president. Like, come on. Dude. Yeah. And so, but, but what happens is, is he's, he's now seen as the alternative to Biden uh, because Biden's got a lot of stuff hitting him uh, from the impeachment stuff that, you know, that's what Trump was wanting to get done, and he accomplished what he wanted there. Now, Biden has his own set of issues beyond and above all of that, but he was still like the leading front runner and assumed um, he has candidate the, before. Yeah, all he of has that. the mantle of centrism and electability. And yeah, and he's he, a vice uh, president underneath Obama, which a lot of Democrats like. So he's going to win the Democrat nomination, obviously, right out of the box, right? So that's where uh, I think the the attacks from the the right on him uh unfairly have have weakened him so people are looking for an alternative and i think that's where pete comes in uh as that alternative because i don't think they're going to go to warren right if you look at there's there's polling done on who first and second choices are for a lot of people so um you'd think that's that sanders second choice would be warren but it's not it's pete yeah that doesn't make any sense to me because you would think it would be the other left leaning Democrat. But here's the problem that we have here on the show between you and I is we try to think about this stuff and we think of it through as a rational lens as possible. And like, mm -hmm. you know, our, our good buddy, the wall reader, W A L reader came out the third edition. So go on Amazon and buy the wall reader edition three. You can get the first two issues of our magazine there or you can go to wallreader.com and ryan Lindsay edits that and ryan is uh ryan is i call him a young padwan and uh he he's a very thoughtful person very intelligent person and he just he's but he's fairly he leans left and he goes i just can't believe that all those people would let themselves be used in the state of the union as pawns for trump and i go sometimes you have to remember that 50 percent of this country likes trump and those people like Trump and they want to be used by Trump. like I think we sometimes think everybody's a rational person. Everybody is using common sense and they're just not like, uh, did you see the woman who, when she learned her candidate was gay? So oh, yeah. Listen, yeah, listen to this caucus goer in Iowa. She's a, uh, a fairly homely woman, uh, older woman, kind of a boomer look. And she's got a bunch of stickers on her and uh, she is talking to two, two people younger Pete Buttigieg people came so over to so you that woman you just, sorry, are you saying he has a same sex marriage and then the two Pete people reply he, yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> are you kidding yeah, he's married to him yeah. well, then I don't want anybody like that in the White House <laughs> so can I have my card back I don't know signed it we could go ask I never knew that. Well, so the whole point of it is, though, is he's a human being, right? Just Let me stop you right there. You're presuming that this woman cares that he's a human being or even thinks that. <laughs> like, uh, she's so, she's like, so, like, he's a human being. Like, she's trying so hard. She's so polite. And you can see on her face, she's just like, I cannot deal with this level of ignorance. How does this person not know that Pete's gay? And how can she not support him now that she knows he's gay? And she's like, uh, I, I don't think you could change your vote, but let me try and talk you into it. I mean, how, how? And should it really matter? That's what. Well, he better read the Bible. He does. And he says that God doesn't choose a political party. Because why does it say in the Bible that a man should marry a woman then? Well, I totally respect yeah. your viewpoint on this. I so totally do. But I think that we were not around. How come this has never been brought out before? It's, it's common knowledge. They're dumb. I've never heard it. Um, <laughs> there's a, there's another woman in the frame, and when she says, "How's this not come out that he's gay?" Like the woman's face says you dumb bitch like you would not believe you got to look this video up it's just it's it's crazy but yeah i mean th this woman is wearing pete stickers showed up to vote for pete and she didn't know he was gay like 
I mean, that's kind of the first thing that people find out about the guy, right? Like, well, and it's not even it's not even not that it. she didn't know he was gay. It's that that's the one that's the issue that I mean, she's a big supporter of Pete. She likes everything he's saying, right. all the things he's doing, and then finds out he's gay, and I'm like, oh no, I can't support him at all. Right. That. He better read the Bible. <laughs> and like, I, I just go, this is the perfect example of like, we spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff because we love it. We're into it. The people that are listening to the show are willing to listen to 90 to 120 minute long podcasts about politics every week and get really granular. Or you're just like, you're curious enough to understand, but like you have to realize most people just don't, they're not thinking at that, even that level. Did you see the thing I posted yesterday about the the Daily Show thing where they did the Finger the Pulse episode? I really like oh. the Finger the Pulse. Um, he went and talked to people at a Trump rally um, and asked them their opinion on you know the impeachment and things like that. And it, the the things that these people were saying are, are just as crazy as as what she, this this woman in Iowa said. One of them was saying, "Well, I don't like Bolton. Bolton's a liar." And the guy interviewed him and said, wouldn't it be great if there was a way that we could, that's why he, they don't want him calling him as a witness because he's a liar. He says, wouldn't it be great if there was some way that we could like have him take an oath and swear <laughs> that he's going to tell the truth and then hold him criminally liable if he does. And they're like, yeah, that would be great if we had something like that for him to do. And it, it was just so right. obviously. And then another woman was, you know, saying some stuff i can't remember what it was saying that he didn't do this or or he wants all the information to be out and the guy says no he's blocking the information and then she just says well i don't care mm -hmm. right right that, it's like completely it different down. it doesn't matter as long as it supports their people they are just like somehow just locked in for whatever reason and it's different reasons for a lot of different people but then they just shut off and are so partisan that they won't even consider that they might be wrong. I, I, I know it's so there was an article recently that I just saw that kind of hits on this. Um, let's see if I can sort it by date. Uh, humans are hardwired to dismiss facts that don't fit their worldview. This was on Yahoo. Um, by a professor of philosophy at Wake Forest. Uh, something is rotten in the state of American political life. The U.S. is increasingly characterized by highly polarized and formally insult insulated ideological communities occupying their own factual universes. Um, then he goes on to bash Republicans because they're all stupid assholes, of course, blah, 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 yawn. Um, <laughs> not, the reality of human-caused global warming is settled science. Uh, let's go on to the actual point. Um, in theory, resolving factual disputes should be relatively easy. Just present evidence of strong expert consensus. This approach succeeds most of the time when the issue is, say, the atomic weight of hydrogen. But things don't work that way when scientific consensus presents a picture that threatens someone's ideological worldview. In practice, it turns out that one's political, religious, or ethnic identity quite effectively predicts one's willingness to accept expertise on any given politicized issue. Motivated reasoning is what social scientists call the process of deciding what evidence to accept based on the conclusion one prefers. Uh, in his book, In the Truth About Denial, this very human tendency applies to all kinds of facts about the physical world, economic history, and current events. Denial doesn't stem from ig ignorance. The interdisciplinary study of this phenomenon has exploded over just the last six or seven years. One thing has become clear. The failure of various groups to acknowledge the truth about, say, climate change is not explained by a lack of information about scientific consensus on the subject. Instead, what strongly predicts denial of expertise on many controversial topics is simply one's political persuasion. Um, you know, the ideological polarization over rea the reality of climate change actually increases with respondents' knowledge of politics, science, and or energy policy. The chances about a, that a conservative is a climate change denier is significantly higher if he or she is college educated. So. You know, they go on, and of course, they always use the, Repu the, the Republicans, and they're, you know, I feel bad for the conservatives because they're always the stupids. They're always the, the well, example of how dumb and how uh, stupid everyone is, but it just shows you how strong tribalism is, right. which is really and, the point of this argument. And I agree with you that it's, it's on both sides of it. The problem is, is that the Republicans have kind of um, embraced and 
anti-intellectualism over the past couple of decades, right? Um, it what used is to be different. I mean, Peter Buckley, you know. Yeah, but what is intellectual about thinking yeah. that the Green New Deal works? No, no, no. I, I agree. I say I agree completely. There's still tribalism on both sides, and there's people who shut down and lock out um, on both sides. I just think that's why a lot of people take swipes at the, the Republicans is because they are kind of almost um, parading that as what they want, right? It, I, it's like they're seeing it as a virtue. Not not all of them, I know, but it, it has been kind of the. That's why they wanted Bush in, right? Because Bush was he was folksy and down to earth and he wasn't a, an elitist and he wasn't a super intelligent and all this, you know, it, it's he, he not, was, it's he was not a normal that, person. It's not that you're wrong. It's right. that I don't know if I totally agree with you because I just believe that the left has a better PR department because the majority of people that work in media are left leaning and right. make culture. And so they want to use, just like the Lear Institute, they want to use culture and the news to basically make their enemies look like knuckle-dragging idiots. Right, but that's, I mean, that, that's but there's reality. a reason why a, a lot of those are, are, are liberals is because they see the anti-intellectualism of the right and, and shy away from it, I think. Yeah, but they just um, believe, they believe in the myths of economics that don't work. They, they well, hold views that- So that, do the Republicans, though. Uh, of course. I mean, I'm not arguing that it's not a it's not a one versus the other. I'm saying no, no, no. I, I agree. Like, I'm not. I'm saying that anti intellectualism exists everywhere. It, it exists in the libertarian movement, which we're going to get the yeah. vermin supreme here in just a moment. I mean, we, how many times are you and I having a conversation about how can these libertarians believe this? Like, how what? what yeah. Why don't Why don't they get it? Why isn't this so clear? Like, we have this in our own group. We have twenty, thirty people in our chat. And there's just times where I look at Ryan Lindsay or you, and I'm just like, what are you two on? And I'm sure you two do the same to me. Like, the, you know, and then Tad gets in there and we all go, what? Um, uh -huh. So it, it is just a, it's tribalism is a very powerful force. The problem that the left makes that drives people more towards anti-intellectualism in the form of somebody like Trump is mm -hmm. the condescension. The condescension right, right. is something that is incredibly insulting to people on the right and it's acceptable behavior for people on the left to show that you are part of the left by condescending to how stupid republicans are just look at these little yeah. idiots oh yeah that's part of the problem yeah that's definitely part of the problem there too is that people are being driven away from that because of that reason so that's that's how it, this divide just cards just starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger and that's where we end up where we're at now is because both right. sides are just they're kind of wanting that they, they want that separation. They want the us versus them. The, that way you don't have to think about their arguments, right? So you can just dismiss everything the other side says just because they're the other side. All right. Right. All right. Let's move on because I do want to talk about vermin Supreme because it touches on this briefly. Um, I saw one of the dumbest articles I've ever seen in my entire life being shared and getting a ton of shares on social media by libertarians. And I know that my 2020 pledge is to not really discuss a lot of inside baseball with libertarian politics because almost none of you care about it. Uh, and you can get endless discussions on that in Facebook groups. But uh, this is from nationalfile.com. I don't know the author's name. This is a website that somebody put up and then wrote an article. Oh, and uh, before you get into it, though, that remember, I went to that page when it first kind of hit uh -huh. and all of the ads on there were pro Trump, support Trump, give Trump your money. Ads. Oh, OK. Well, that makes sense then, because this is a very stupid article that is. Yes, very, it is. That is very divisive towards. It's basically making libertarians look stupid. Uh, it, it, and, and it was shared by like, I don't it wasn't being libertarian, but it was a big libertarian page and it had like a thousand shares. And I'm just like. Why is a libertarian page? These libertarian pages just love to take shots at the LP and make the libertarian movement look worse by promoting somebody like Vermin Supreme doing well. And you just go, are you guys really just working for the opposition? Like, are we try all trying to build a movement here or are we all trying to tear each other apart? Uh, but allow me to tear each other apart in, in analyzing this. I don't know if, who wrote this or what it is, but um, somehow Vermin Supreme is winning the Libertarian Party's 2020 presidential primaries. I keep seeing this because of the New Hampshire thing. I talked to, um, you know, I've, I've talked to a few people about this and 
I got the details on it because I'm sitting here when I saw that Vermin Supreme won the I or the New Hampshire caucus. I'm just like, there just yeah. is no way that a guy with a boot on the head who was literally the joke of the race on CN C SPAN in 2012 is somehow the front runner in the 2020 election. And well, I, I thought, and yeah, there's no primary. I mean, that's the worst right. part of this is there's no such thing <laughs> as a primary. It's a poll that they took. This is a person who doesn't that. understand politics. And this is the problem with so many people trying to do an, analyze the news right now is they have no experience and they got involved in politics in 2016 and now they're all experts and they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. And this is one of these people. Um, and so I talked to our friend, good friend, Joe Bishop Henchman, who's running for chair. Uh, make sure you check him out. And uh, also a Patreon member of this fine program. And he Great said, Let's, here's the thing about that New Hampshire thing is let me actually go read what he said that because I was like, OK, I don't get it. How could this possibly? Uh, he said everyone could vote for a first choice, second choice and unlimited third choices. And they added them all together. It's some voting method that doesn't make sense to me, but is accepted by the people who accept such things. So that's how Vermin got from 26 votes for, to he got 26 votes from nine voters out of 140 votes from 44 voters. And so he ended up winning this, this poll because everybody got to vote for their first choice, their second choice, and unlimited third choices. And so if you're sitting there filling it out and go, okay, well, there's only one normal person here, and then there's a bunch of psychos, and then I guess I'll just troll and vote for the guy with the boot on his head because he wants to give everyone a free pony. And so that's how that guy ended up winning. But this journalist at nationalfile.com didn't do that. And so he writes, Vermin Supreme currently leads the race, which is not true. After a poor 2016 performance from Gary Johnson and Bill Weld, rocked with such catastrophes as overweight male strippers and Johnson not knowing Aleppo was a Syrian city then occupied by the Islamic State, the Libertarian Party seems uniquely poised to gain momentum in 2020 with the seemingly unpopular, at least according to the polls incumbent, and a Democratic Party facing an internal debate over whether to embrace socialism or centrism. Now, let's start with Gary Johnson having a poor performance in 2016. This is a widely held by view by a lot of online libertarians. This is the fucking stupidest thing I've ever heard from any of you people. This is a very exactly. dumb opinion. <laughs> Gary Johnson took libertarians had been getting less than 1% of the vote in elections for pretty much the entire existence of the party. And especially in recent elections, Gary Johnson got 3% of the national vote, multiple States in the United States because States, and Republicans and Democrats never thought that libertarians could get more than 1% in a presidential election, tied presidential elections to their ballot access because they thought there's no way these idiots will ever get more than 1%. And so we'll keep them down by not allowing them to have ballot access by putting the ballot access threshold at something like 1.5 or 2% or 3%. Well, Gary Johnson hit 3%, and there are many states that are voting for the first time with automatic ballot access because of Gary Johnson. So how do, you, how do you possibly look at the Gary Johnson campaign as a failure? It's, it just leads back to tribalism. You see people that you like, like the Tom Woods crowd, say that this was an absolute abject failure of a campaign, when it, in reality, the campaign was pretty shitty. I'm not going to lie to you. But Gary Johnson, as a candidate, did more interviews in a week than he did all of 2016. I counted. I know. Okay. It was not a failure. The man got 3%. And so what are we going to get in 2020? Are we going to get 3% or 4% or 5%? No, we're probably going to get 1% because we're going to nominate somebody that has the charisma of a dish rag and the ability to be president like, well, basically I would. I mean, I'd probably be more confident than almost any of these people. Adam Kokesh is an accused wife beater who's been arrested multiple times. He's, by all accounts of people around him, an absolute psycho. Ben Letter, just watch him online, absolute psycho. Uh, Dan Bierman has a big, giant yellow hat on his head that he refuses to take off in debates because that's his brand. Like, these are the front runners. Kim Ruff was the only one that was even remotely not embarrassing, and she had to drop out because of personal issues. Uh, Jacob Hornberger's in the race. He's somebody that I truly respect. 
I think he is a great messenger for the libertarian movement, but I also think he's kind of negative. I mean, if you listen to him, it's a lot of like, you should have listened to me 30 years ago and it, because you didn't, everything sucks now. Well, that's not exactly hope and change and what people are attracted to. And I don't know that he can put a cabinet together. Like I'm sure Sheldon Richmond will make a great secretary of war. But other than that, I don't know who he's putting in cabinet posts. So we're going into 2020 completely unprepared again as a party. And I'm just not going to vote for the candidate. I might vote for Jacob Hornberger. But I'm definitely not going to vote. I'll actively campaign against Adam Kokesh or Dan Bierman or Arvin Vora or any of those nut jobs. And certainly not Vermin Supreme. Gary Johnson's campaign was not a failure. And when you say that, you tell everybody who understands politics that you don't understand politics. Like, I'm just going to level with you. Don't sound stupid when you say that sort of thing. Like, you can make legitimate criticisms of his campaign in that he had absolutely no strategy that made sense. Yeah, Aleppo was embarrassing, but he has a pretty uh, he has a pretty good explanation of why he said what he said. Bill Weld at the time wasn't a great choice. I'll be honest with you. Larry Sharp would have been a much better choice. But were you a delegate in 2016 that voted for Bill Weld or not? If you weren't there, then you didn't get a say. And because you chose not to go and participate in the process, Bill Weld got through. So if you don't want that embarrassment there then go and participate be a delegate um you know bringing up james weeks dancing on the stage uh is just the most tired trope i've ever seen from people and it it sometimes comes from libertarians but it's usually barely cognizant almost non-functioning republican little brains who are on social media who are just trying to get a rise out of a libertarian that is an immediate sign when somebody brings up James Weeks that they don't know what they're talking about. So don't say it. Like, just, like this person is an absolute moron already. We're not even a paragraph into this article, and I cannot fathom how absolutely dumb this is. However, the Libertarian Party appears to be embracing a new tradition of bucking mainstream politics altogether with a stellar performance by Vermin Supreme. In a non-binding presidential preference primary, New Hampshire voters chose Supreme over traditional candidates with normal names by a margin of nearly 10%. As a result, Supreme now has a whopping four-vote lead over Kim Ruff, who withdrew the, from the race in January. There's no primary, as Reinhold pointed out. A primary means that somehow they're collecting delegates and they're by, that these delegates are bound to Kim Ruff. That's not how the party works. So again, this person doesn't know how the president, the presidential nominee in the party gets picked, but he's somehow a source of information. How it works is you go to your state party, you get chosen to be a delegate, you fly to be a delegate in, what is it, where is it, Austin this year? Austin, Texas this year, yes. You go to Austin, and then you vote. You, you give tokens for people to get on the stage, for them to qualify to get on the stage, and then those candidates get to advance to the next round. That's the closest thing to a primary. There is no primary. There is no binding delegates at these conventions. Like this it's is actually against the bylaws to have binding, yeah. any kind of bindings from the state parties. Yeah. If you were a delegate that is going to Austin from Indiana and there's 40 delegates, let's say, all 40 of those people could vote for different people if they wanted to. You're not showing up and as often a often do. <laughs> yeah, right. You're not, you can vote for Joe Jorgensen. You're not bound to vote for Adam Kokesh if everybody else in the state says so. So this means Supreme actually has a 20% lead in the popular vote over his closest rival, Joe Jorgensen, who garnered a total of 17 votes. Talking 17 votes here, okay? 20% lead in the popular vote of what? I don't know what this person is talking about. I think there was like 28 or 30 delegates or something like it's some small number like that too i'm finding and, out the name of this person this person is too yeah. dumb this person well, and is, the funny thing the thing is too is that it, in anything like this any kind of polling like this that is non-binding if you had a care uh, if you had a candidate who changed their name to liberty mcliberty face <laughs> they would win right i mean that's just the way it is the libertarians love to just troll and go like that so yeah when it's not something that's actually important. And, and that's what this is. It's just a poll. All right. This person is too dumb not to be publicly shamed. We'll, we'll save that for the end. Um, 
uh, watch he's a listener who was just about to become a patreon member i don't care you're too dumb i don't want you uh, it should be note. So, uh, it should be noted that uh, okay, Supreme himself now leads with the popular vote, total of 44 votes, more than twice as close as competition, potentially paving the way for President Supreme to take the Oval Office in 21. It should be noted that New Hampshire Libertarian Party does not have ballot access in the state, and as a result, mailed ballots to prominent party members to garner these results. The ballots also featured ranked choice voting, meaning New Hampshire Libertarians were able to vote for more than one candidate. National file should also note that all of these candidates below Jorgensen, including such prominent names as Dan Taxation as Theft Beerman, receive less vote less votes than none of the above. Adam Kokesh, a former radio and TV host who was imprisoned after carrying a shotgun in DC to protest city gun laws, also did not receive a single vote. You see how the press this do you think that that particular couple of paragraphs would be any different than the Washington Post? Daniel the Taxation It would, it would be Beerman. different. It would be different because most of those probably wouldn't even be mentioned. They would just be the laughable other candidates or something well, like that. It would Adam, they wouldn't Adam, even go to the the effort of finding out what the story is. Right. The 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 point is that if Adam Kokesh is the nominee, it will be Adam Kokesh, a former radio and TV host for RT, who was imprisoned after carrying a shotgun in Washington D.C. to protest the city gun laws, also did not receive a. That's his bio. That's his byline. How does mm -hmm. that win voters? It is unclear oh, yeah. if, Supreme, if Supreme promises that under his president, every American will be given a free pony and undergo mandatory toothbrushing with government-issued toothpaste are in line with the LP's beliefs. No, he's a joke, and that's why everybody's treating him as a joke. And this was Tom Pappert. Tom Pappert is the author of this incredibly stupid article. He is the editor-in-chief for National File. He has previously written for Big League Politics, has had bylines at Breitbart News, and is a regular guest on the Alex Jones show. Okay, there you go. I think that tells you a lot right there on, yeah. on what's really going on here. Let this me, has nothing to do with somebody trying to cover libertarian politics. This is somebody who's trying to push for Trump. Let me, in, in bullshit terms of bios, let me explain to you what Tom Pappert is. He's the editor-in-chief for The National File, a website that he himself put up and writes bullshit articles because he's unemployed. He has previously written for Big League Politics, where he got a post published once because he has a friend that works there, and has bylines at Breitbart News in the comments section. He's also a regular guest on the Alex Jones Show, where he once got on the air after he made a phone call. That's what that actually all means. I don't know. Right. That, that, those are not facts, but Tom Pappert isn't interested in facts, so let me give you the facts that are, I'm going to tell you are true about this person, because he doesn't understand anything about politics at all, and he didn't even make a minute effort to reach out to anybody that would know anything to understand what the fuck is going on. So Tom Pappert, you are officially the stupidest person I have ever seen on the internet. I cannot believe that you have achieved that title, but please put that into your fake byline. So everybody knows how accomplished you are at being a dumbass. Thank you for coming to my Ted talk. I mean, I just, it's just like, it's no different than I have a, a blog. I've been writing, you know, libertarian articles since like the 90s right. so i mean how is that any different and i've been published on other websites a watch blog i was a, a editor over there i still technically am a writer for there if i wanted to i could write on, on their site i've got stuff on newsvine and comments everywhere and news groups i mean i could do the same thing he did and create this big profile and try to manipulate everybody into thinking what i think Listen, but man, i try to do things like I try, I try to write things that are, are sensible and, and logical and thought through, not just hit pieces, yeah. uh, trying to push my agenda. Listen, man, shut the fuck up. You're on We Are Libertarian, something I just flat out made up in 2012, okay? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I get it. Like, I get that he's trying to get something going here and trying to do what he loves, and he's just not good at it. He shouldn't do it anymore. He's never going to get the byline on Breitbart News because he's just too dumb. And sometimes you have to be honest. Tom Pappert, I love you. And so I'm going to sit down across from you as your friend, and I'm going to say to you, you are just too dumb to breathe the same air as anyone working in politics today. Maybe you should try writing for TMZ. I don't even know if you'd meet their journalistic standards. I, I have to cough. I've just talked my <coughs> – I've ruined my voice over Tom Pappert. I, it just, I read it, and it pissed me off so much the other day. And I go yeah. – I know nobody is going to care about this, 
but I have to talk about it because I'm so pissed off. So many people shared something so dumb. So many libertarians hit share on something that they didn't read because they love the headline that completely made libertarians look like a fool. They were actual useful idiots for a Trump person trying to make us look stupid to help Trump get reelected. Like, no. don't be so dumb. You're just as dumb as Tom Papert when you do that. Everybody makes a mistake every once in a while, but at least like 75% of the time, try to read what you share. God. I do want to say one thing in defense of Vermin Supreme. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, mute me now. Yes. Uh, no. This, from what I understand, because ah, I've, I'm I've sorry, talked to some are, of the people muted, who are involved. You are not in... being heard. No one can hear anything you're saying. <laughs> Go ahead. No, I've talked to some people who are involved in the campaign, and from what I understand is that he's actually um, trying to do this seriously this time. He's decided that he wants to become a serious candidate. He's taking the boot off a lot. He's, you know, trying to trying to do things more than just the the ponies. But the problem is, is that he did that for so long. That's all he's going to be known for. Anybody who writes about him in any type of media, if we were to it, if he were to ever get any actual media coverage, which wouldn't happen, it would only be to say, look at this. This is the type of person that these people are putting up. Um, it, and this guy's they would never just give James us any. Weeks. It's yeah. exactly what you're saying. He's talking about James Weeks. They show the lowest common denominator shit. I have heard that Vermin Supreme is actually a very normal, nice man. And so that's why I'm not saying anything too terrible about him. I'm, I'm sure he's a lovely person. Um, but at, at a certain point, libertarians do have to understand that there are some rules to this and that you can – like that's why Jacob Hornberger is the only – like I, I haven't looked into Jorgensen or any of these people. Like I'm not going to Austin. I don't care who they pick. Like I'm, I'm going to vote for Amash. I would actively support Amash, but I don't know that he's going to run. Um, but Hornberger is somebody that can articulate a lot of different libertarian beliefs about a lot of different subjects – and would do a good job, and he's going to show up in a suit, and he looks presentable, and he's a businessman. And, like, your average person, when you're sitting with your friends and family, and they go, who have you guys nominated? You want to be able to say Gary Johnson, a two-time New Mexican governor, or Jacob Hornberger, who's a business owner, who, you know, you should check out this video. He's pretty art articulate about a lot of stuff. Like, not, here's the guy who's going to give you free toothpaste and ponies. Like, you're not even going to promote that candidate. And so, yeah, we do have to have a principled person, but you also have to have somebody that your normie friends and family will actually take a look at. This isn't all just a joke. And if you want to treat it like a joke, then join the Audacious Caucus, wave around a bunch of pink dildos, and then we can all know not to take you seriously unless our, we're Joshua Smith, where we see somebody in the Audacious Caucus and we're going to demagogue against them to build our own movement. Jackass. So. Speaking yeah. of someone who doesn't understand politics. Yeah. Joshua Smith, if you guys, you guys have to understand, Joshua Smith is lying to you. Joshua Smith barely showed up to LNC meetings. He was an absolutely divisive, poor leader on the LNC. He was um, embarrassing and embarrassingly drunk at many points at our state convention and at the national convention in Louisiana. Uh, the fact that he has been accused of domestic violence and then chose break the cycle as his campaign slogan is one of the most disgraceful things I've ever seen. This person is a demagogic person who has convinced a lot of people that he's to be taken seriously because he's glommed onto the Mises caucus, which is full of well-meaning, decent people who actually want to make a difference for a, a deeply held ideological belief system. And uh, he's an absolute user and you're being taken advantage of, and you should really take a look at his history, who this person is, and watch him closely. And better yet, criticize Joshua Smith within earshot of the guy and see if he has any self-control. He doesn't. I, I, Reinhold and I can tell you firsthand he does not have self-control. So Joshua Smith is not somebody you should put on your profile picture because anybody who's been around longer than a couple of years knows this guy is trouble. This guy is not a nice person. This guy is taking advantage of people. And frankly, I like Michael Heiss, and I like a lot of people in the, in the Mises Caucus, and I think they're doing good work, and I think they have made an absolutely enormous 
strategic error in attaching themselves to this person. Jacob Hornberger's not in the same boat. He should not endorse this person. Tom Woods should not have Joshua Smith on his show and endorse him. It makes Tom Woods, it makes me go, dude, what are you doing? I respect you. Like, but when I see people fall for Joshua Smith, I am absolutely embarrassed that this person has been able to uh, propagate his bullshit for so long. So, um, and he's the type of person that if he heard this would go, he just hates the Mises caucus. He hates Michael Heiss. He hates our movement. Look, rally against this guy. And that's the exact problem with that guy. We don't need to introduce Trump into the Trump mentality into libertarian, the libertarian movement. We are way too small to be divisive and to use dividing each other to grow as we have always done, which is why we're at 3%, soon to be 1%, you know? And so if you see people making an effort to make other libertarians look bad, they're a lot of the problem. I, I, the thing about We Are Libertarians is that, and the, and the reason that I have Reinhold on here, as you can hear, is he's a very intelligent person who I argue with and we disagree a lot on, on almost everything. But he's fundamentally a good man who has his heart in the right place. And we don't have to agree for us, for me to have him. I'm not trying to get you to believe what I believe the way that I believe it and do what I say. I can get rich or I can get the chair of the national party. Like I'm not trying to game you. I'm trying to inform you. I, I mean, Ryan Lindsay and I couldn't be further apart on a lot of stuff. And he, he runs the magazine. And there are a lot of people who go, why would you have this person contribute to your magazine? The first edition had a libertarian socialist article. And I go, I don't know, because I want to understand what a libertarian socialist is. And I'm secure enough in my ideology that I'm not threatened by other people disagreeing with what I believe. And I believe that my audience are full of adults who can understand, can hear other opinions and not be swayed by it. Like there were literally... 13 people who identified as libertarian socialist at the convention in 2018 to hear Joshua Smith tell you it, it was a movement overtaking the entire convention. It was at best 16 delegates. If that out of a thousand delegates, when Matt Can Cano said something about rent is theft on the stage, the entire room booed the guy. There's no threat of leftism taking over the libertarian movement. Nick Sarwark is not a CIA plant because his brother gifted him a subscription to Stratfor, which is just a, a run-of-the-mill foreign policy site that a lot of conspiracy theorists go, oh, well, they're CIA. I got news for you. I'm a subscriber to Stratfor. When you listen to our foreign policy episodes, do I tell, do, does it sound like I'm telling you uh, CIA talking points? Or am I telling you exactly what you need to hear, which is, Foreign interventionism doesn't work and it kills innocent people and their lives are valuable. But I want to know what other people are saying because I'm an adult and you should be an adult too. And what I, I'm not a particular fan of the way that Nick's hard work does things. Uh, Nick and I were pretty decent friends and I would say that that relationship is fairly frosty now. Um, not so much on my part, but I, I don't think that he's as uh, I think it's a little frostier on his because I've been critical of him. Uh, and, and, and I think it's unfair when people like it gets out of control and he's called a CIA plant and people repeat that shit, not knowing where it comes from. And it just makes people who understand where it comes from go, this person's just easily manipulated. And so I'm just going to say to all you libertarians, really check your sources and really figure out before you share shit where this stuff comes from. Because sometimes the dumbest things I see are shared by libertarians and you need to be the smartest people in the room to win for us to grow. You have to be the most educated about the political system in the room. You have to know the rules of the two parties and the, and the government system inside and out to, to win. You have to know all this stuff. You have to understand how political strategy, how political science, how organizing, how canvassing, how all of these things work so you can actually start to win. Because if you don't, we're never going to win. We're just going to be a bunch of blowhards on the internet and nobody's going to ever take us seriously because we're all trolling each other. Like, I just don't want to be a part of that. Like, I have no interest in being a part of that movement. Like, I we have got people. Go ahead. Yeah, we got people right now who are kind of identified as leaders within the movement who I don't think have even 
taking the time out to watch the Crash Course Politics series. You know, some basic civil. Well, what, is civil that, uh, what is that going to do for me? Politics, right? I mean, they're all about can I be popular? Can I do the things that other people have done to get popular? And then people will love me, and that's that's how I'm going to make what I want to have happen happen. And I'm going to take over the party, and I'm going to kick out all of these people who tr- truck in identity politics or all the socialists or or all the all the racists or all the Nazis and all these people too. I mean, we've got issues in the party that have been around for decades that we're just not dealing with. Um, but we're everybody wants to to make it a, a fight, a war against this faction, against that faction. We have caucuses now in the party. I'm like, why do we have caucuses? We we're already small enough. We all believe in the same basic things. Why can't we just all agree to talk to each other and disagree with each other instead of creating these little fiefdoms because, where we can attack each other? Because tribalism makes it – tribalism is more profitable. <laughs> and mm-hmm. tribal, tribalism makes it easier to galvanize a movement behind you. And then yeah, it makes it easier to discount something that somebody says is because they're from the other tribe. Yeah, so uh, wrapping up on this because we still have to talk about impeachment and the State of the Union. <laughs> Um, and we're an hour and a half in. This is just going to be a long one because we've got to cover that stuff. Uh, but, you know, really pay attention to what you're hearing, what you're saying. Understand where it comes from. Think it through. Don't just take the word. I, I don't want you to take the word of anything I say here. Like, if you hear something and you're like, that doesn't sound right, Google it. And if I, I'm wrong, it happens. He's wrong all the time. Like, Harry's wrong. Like everybody, everybody who does this that talks into a microphone or writes, like they're wrong or like just make sure you're just fact checking shit. Cause a lot of libertarians shared this article and this is embarrassingly not only is it embarrassing for the movement, it's intentionally trying to embarrass the movement. It's intentionally trying to manipulate people. And libertarians were useful idiots by the thousands on this thing. I saw it shared all over the place over the weekend and by big libertarian pages and it just it drives me nuts because this is a maga person that is intentionally trying to make you look stupid and you're helping so please um let's talk about our patrons want to thank everybody who is a patron we are only in existence because of you and especially our 100 dollars a month subscribers ed brehob matthew durbin jeff bennett jason doolittle um Congratulations to Jason. I won't share his news, but a joyous occasion at the Doolittle household. And uh, Craig DaCosta and, uh, and Christy Avery wrote me a lovely letter. She's a $100 a month subscriber. And uh, if you want to write in and talk about what the show has done and, or how it has helped you, then please hit us up at editor at wearelibertarians.com. Christy Avery writes, this network has inspired me to be more involved in the libertarian movement and in charitable giving. I have a great group of friends now that I will have for the rest of my life. I'm so proud of the impact I see the network making for other listeners. Keep on going. Keep on keeping on. Much love, Christy Avery. We love you, Christy, and thank you so much. And we appreciate all of your support, both morally and uh, financially. And, um, yeah. So let's just touch on the State of the Union before we go to impeachment. Uh, impeachment Trump. for last, huh? Yeah, because so it's it, it, off. We'll, we'll just keep going. <laughs> I, and that's when I'll be really tired and I can just sit back and go, all right, screech, fine. Um, so Trump gave the State of the Union speech last night. It is his fourth speech to the Joint Congress, third State of the Union. And uh, Trump, Trump was trying out, like, I will, I will tell you, I think he has had a really good week in a lot of ways. Because the Democrats looked incompetent and they couldn't impeach him. Like, you have to really go, how is this guy so lucky? He really is the Teflon candidate. He's the Teflon man in American politics. He just keeps getting hit and hit and hit, and nothing seems to affect him. He hit 49%, which is the highest approval rating in a, in a poll over this past week. Uh, and in a lot of ways, he, he had a great Super Bowl ad. I don't know if you saw the Super Bowl ad about criminal justice reform. I thought it was very good. He was advertising. He's clearly based on that and the State of the Union speech trying to reach out to uh, white women, minorities of any (laughs) variety. He's trying to like salvage some of the independents in those in those uh, identity groups because he's absolutely he's in like single digits in some of those categories. Um, 
And so he realizes I've only got a, I've only got a, I've got a ceiling. And so if I'm going to actually win, I have to start winning with, uh, with independence. And that speech last night, you know, he had the, he had the Super Bowl ad, and then he had the Iowa caucus failure, and everybody laughing at the Democrats, and then they can't impeach him. And it's just like at some point, dude, like if you're a Democrat, you got to be so pissed. Like you nominate the, you, the, the least likable candidate in the history of American politics in 2016, cheated Bernie out of the nomination, had her email stolen because they couldn't change the word password, and, and still to this day is blaming everybody but herself. She said something shitty about Bernie saying he didn't help her win in 2016. When that man, I have, listen, it's not that I want to say something nice about Bernie Sanders, but that man swallowed his pride and went out and campaigned. I remember stops. He made phone calls for her. He gave speeches for her. He made media appearances for her after he found out that she had rigged the primary against him. And she had the gall to go out this week and say that he didn't do anything to help her. So frankly, Hillary Clinton, you can go after yourself. Um, but so Hillary, so the Democrats nominate Hillary Clinton. She loses. They, they never actually look inward. They just blame big tech and the Russians for losing, even though Donald Trump's polling, Donald Trump's vote, vote, he didn't really activate a lot of new base. It really was the same as Mitt Romney in a lot of ways. A lot of Democrats just didn't show up. They didn't vote, show up to vote for Hillary Clinton. It was her own fault. It, she's the reason that she lost. And then, like, they don't want to impeach. And then they end up having to impeach. And then they can't impeach. And then Iowa happens. It's just like the losses for the Democrats. They're taking a lot of L's lately. And then Trump comes out and gives this speech last night. It seems like Trump has finally hit the place where he's comfortable being president. He knows what he's doing. His campaign is fairly savage and on top of it. The messaging that came out of that campaign over the last couple of days is really solid for driving up their base. Um, and it's what you would expect from Trump. It doesn't inspire me in any way, but their base, I think, is going to get it. He gives this speech where he's talking about all his accomplishments for uh, on the economy, and he he and his, it was a campaign speech, but every election year or so too is a campaign speech. Don't let Chuck Todd's hyperventilating fool you about that. Every president does it. Uh, you know, lowest black unemployment. Camera goes right to all the black Democrats not standing up and clapping. Lowest female unemployment goes right to all the female Democrats not standing. Lowest, like lowest, like, you got granular one point, like, and it's the lowest black, Latina, lesbian, female employment. And then they can only go to like one representative. And so the speech was just crafted to give him photo op after photo op after photo op. And it was basically him giving a speech to Congress that he can then use in ads over and over and over. He brings out all these people with these moving stories. And he executed that part of it completely flawlessly. And then he gets the Rush Limbaugh. Is Rush Limbaugh the freedom of metal? medal of freedom and and like for the first time ever does it in the so too and she's got the medal and putting it around him and rush is crying looking frail after announcing his lung cancer like and listen i don't agree with rush limbaugh very much but as a, a person who wants to do talk radio grew up idolizing rush i feel terrible for the man and i pray for a speedy recovery and i was like as a person who works in talk radio and works with people that work with Rush Limbaugh, like you go, it, it, it's like he's in your industry, you know what I mean? And so it was just a very touching moment. I was like, you know, maybe, maybe one day there's hope for talk radio people where we'll be respected as an industry. Um, <clears throat> but gives all these, all these like emotional, like the mom with the, the preemie baby and, the dad coming home from Afghanistan in front of the whole room and everybody exploding. And then he gets to immigration and I'm going to lock all the Brown people up. And you're like, this guy cannot help himself. He cannot do anything to help himself. He gives this glowing, amazing speech that independents are going to go. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh no. Now I remember why I hate you. Never mind. You know, and then you get at the end Nancy Pelosi standing up, and I swear I've seen Nancy Pelosi rip the speech up in the past, just kind of sitting there because I thought it was kind of remarkable, and I tweeted it out. I couldn't find the tweet, but 
she stood up and ripped it and like he apparently snubbed her but i maintain that he like just didn't look back at her and didn't see that she extended her hand but he wasn't intentionally he wasn't trying to shake her hand in the first place yeah, it's hard to tell on that because he didn't try to he didn't shake uh, Pence's hand either. So I don't think he yeah. was thinking shake the hand, right? So right. I'll give him a pass on that one, saying I don't think he meant to diss her. I don't think he was he would he didn't go out of it's his something way. he would have done though. I mean, it's something yeah. you would believe him to do. Yeah, uh, but I don't I don't think that was going through his mind at the time. Yeah, I I agree, and so I think here's what I would say if I were you and I was talking to my friends about this stuff. You're more grown up. You, listener, are more grown up. You, friend of listener, are more grown up than these people. He can't shake her hand. She's tearing up speeches. So why are you outsourcing the governing of your life and the managing of your economy to these idiots? Right. They're, they're govern, not any better than you, and they don't govern know your life. Yeah. Right. It's, it's just silly to, to keep putting these people up as, as leaders, right? And I use the quotes not, leaders uh, because – they're not leading anybody They're it's, it's the most frustrating thing. Cause you would think as, as bad as people um, approve of Congress, that they're all still getting reelected um, as bad as people approve of Trump. He's still getting up there and, and having such strong support among his base. It's, it's uh, weird to see everybody just kind of, giving their lives up to, to people telling them how to live their lives. Right. You know, why, what is wrong with, and this is what I was always said, and this is how I kind of realized I was a libertarian way, 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 way back when, because I didn't know what a libertarian was. And I just said, I just want the government to basically keep us from killing each other, yeah. protect her, you know, so we can sue each other. If we do something against each other, you know, to protect ourselves, but otherwise leave us the hell alone and right. let us figure out our own lives and do our own things. And somebody said, "Oh, that sounds like a libertarian," and that's when I went, "Oh, I wonder what that is." I went and looked it up because right. grew up. I grew up in the in the seventies when we didn't have internet, so <laughs> you didn't see or hear about this stuff, you know. Um, and now, but yeah, that's that. That's you know, it, it just it just boggles my mind because I've never really thought that these people were deserving any kind of accolades or idol worship or anything. Yeah, that's why I always go after mainly the president lately because. The president is um, gained so much power over the past few decades that I think that's where the real issue is on a lot of things going on between, you know, all the stuff he's doing between waging war without approvals with executive orders, with just doing what he wants to do and nobody calling him out on it on the, on the, uh, in the Senate where they should be or the Congress where they should be. Then. So yeah, I, I went hard after Bush. I went hard after Obama and I'm going hard after Trump because I think that's those are, are the people who are really driving a lot of this stuff that we need to kind of counter but yeah right. the representatives aren't doing it themselves any favor they you know I and we're going to get into impeachment and I've got a thing to say about that um, but they know that they're completely impotent and they just keep doing it I think if yeah, you are for that. Yeah, if you were under any illusion that Trump is a small government person, that speech ruined it for you. It was it was just big spending program after big spending program. It sounded every bit like Obama twenty fourteen. Right. And, and including all the people he would that Obama used to bring up and say, Look at this and look at this person and they bring all this person's that. personal story. Yeah, it's it's it started I think with Clinton because Clinton was able to kind of get to people by telling personal stories about, you know, about people individually and say, okay, this is the type of person we're trying to help. And he would laud them. And, and that's kind of how it started in the, in the state of the union, I think. Yeah. Um, and it's just caught on because that's where it, it works. It resonates with people and, and people are, are easily kind of taken there because of those individual stories instead of thinking, Oh, wait a minute, this isn't how it is for all this stuff. You know, the, they're not thinking it through and they're just getting manipulated by that, by the emotional manipulation. Yeah. And then you, you know, every big government program, you've got all the Republicans mm -hmm. cheering and clapping and, and Congress is just completely complicit in a lot of it. Yeah. Um, yeah remember, but, remember in the nineties when Newt Gingrich fought against Clinton and we actually got the budget under some sort of control and, and uh, almost a surplus. And yeah. 
And that was because the Republicans cared about debt and they cared about spending and they fought for it and they were willing to shut down the government to get it. Uh, and now we've got uh, their leader of the party who nobody will go against because you'll see what happens. Uh, we'll talk about that. What happens if you go against the president? He, people are just willing to just go along with it to the point where now we're spending more and putting in more programs, socialist programs. He gets up and says, we're never going to let social and socialism take over the United States. And then he sits there and talks about all these social programs he's going to implement. And we're going to, do, we're going to make sure we don't touch Medicare. We're not going to touch social security. We're not going to do anything to fix all these social programs that are already there, but we're never going to let socialism take over. And it's right. just like, how do you guys not see this? You know, again, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's the same it's thing that, with the it's yeah. disconnect. It's tribalism. It's bias confirmation. I mean, it, it all kind of has tied together because we're de just dealing with human beings that want to feel like they belong. I guess this is the age. Yeah. And Paul points out too, in the, in the chat, I just realized I remember this now germ. Um, Trump is a germaphobe. Yeah. So him sh not shaking hands is completely in line with him too. That makes so. total sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. It's time for the main event. Impeach <laughs> impeachment wrapped up today. I saved this for last because I, I uh, have, have reminded you many times. I just don't care. I knew what their outcome was going to be. I was not surprised today. You Mitt weren't surprised Romney at all about the voted one vote. On, Mitt Romney voted with the Democrats on one count and with the Republicans yep. on the other, continuing yep. his flip-flopping milk toast. Which I'm makes gonna no sense, yeah. <laughs> hey, How can somebody be so principled while being so fence straddling? annoyingly moderate it just is I, fuck Mitt Romney <laughs> I, I really respect him but at the same time I'm just like you're so stupid you're just like yeah, he could he could have achieved some things I think with with what he was trying to do but he just couldn't take it there he couldn't you know like stand on for something he was trying to be everything to everybody you can't be that Mitt Romney is the political equivalent of coming while you're on an SSRI like he if you've <laughs> ever been on an antidepressant you know what a Mitt Romney feels like like he just it, it, there's just nothing there like I saw him speak in 2008 here at the Speedway in the press room and like they didn't have a podium for him and so in the press room at the Speedway at the time you you like sat at a desk with the microphones and he just like awkwardly stood behind this desk and and it was literally just like input answer out input question output answer he had a perfect perfectly polished uh answer for everything and then he goes over and speaks and it was technically the greatest speech i've ever given i've ever heard given live like it Mitt Romney was one of the best political speakers i've ever heard but there was absolutely no soul to it whatsoever he's just he doesn't have a natural constituency with the exception, he's, he's, what I think he's literally doing is I think he's trying to be the new McCain. He's trying to run for president of Washington, D.C. And all of those people who go on all the Sunday shows who are in the great book by Mark Leibovich, This Town, The Swamp, like he wants to be beloved by the Rick Wilsons and the Steve Schmitz of the world and be their hero. So Bill Crystal will write glowing pieces about him, but he doesn't realize is none, nobody listens to those people anymore. Like Steve Schmidt is talking about how uh, about the dangers of the imperial presidency. We've got to get this guy out, the, the former campaign manager for John McCain. And you just go, you're a political consultant. You've done this for 20, 30 years. You're literally the guy that put people in power that made the presidency more powerful. Why should I listen to you? Why should anybody take anything you say seriously? You're not a serious person. You're just a blowhard on television. You're, you say you're Republican, and so people will have you on TV to hyperventilate about Donald Trump, and nobody cares anymore. Like, Bill Kristol literally, I couldn't find the tweet. He must have deleted it, but I saw it shared on a, a couple pages. He literally said, you know, I've always been left. I identify as a leftist. I just care about a big military. And now that the Democrats can give that to me, I'm switching parties. I, I have no idea if that's true. I, I don't know if it's Photoshopped, but I heard it teased on like a Jonah Goldberg podcast. So I was like, I assume that they, he must have actually said that shit. Um, but like I said, I couldn't find it on his Twitter. Uh, so I can't verify it. But it's like what we all know like Steve Schmidt, Rick Wilson, Bill Crystal. 
they literally don't care about anything other than hating Trump at this point. They don't really have principles because their principles are politi holding political power and helping people gain political power so they themselves can be important. And so Mitt Romney is trying to be president of those people. I just don't care about Mitt Romney at this point anymore. Like there have been times where he's really impressed me by taking bold stances, but then you go, okay, whatever, man. Like, I just don't, that it wasn't interesting to me. Mitt Romney trying to be edgy is not interesting to me in whatsoever. Like, uh, but it, I, 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 it's I, another thing too. It's like you said, he gave a great speech. What he said in his remarks on why he was voting uh, to to remove Trump was spot on and great. I mean, it was yeah. it was perfectly written, perfectly delivered. Nobody will hear it or care. Right. But it's it, it was pretty pretty well done. So it, it was like it was the concise statement that i wish some of the the house managers had been able to to get to right now there's some other speeches that were given that were pretty good too here and there but just knowing that that was a possibility and it didn't happen and it, you know that's just the way it is so so why but, don't you kind of catch us up what how did it all end what did what did we kind of miss since we last talked about it a couple uh, like a week or two ago like I know that they, the house managers gave their pro and against and he gave his defense and then, you know, they gave their closing statements like a trial and then now everybody acquitted it and they argued over the witnesses, but we kind of covered that past episodes, but like kind of catch us up, give us, give us the dummies guide. Like, Hey, I haven't paid attention to any of this, but I want to sound like I have any kind of understanding of what ha happened. Please help me. I don't know what I'm so talking So I think we were about. talking about the possibility of witnesses last time. So what happened was, is that, they they pushed to try to have the have the debate to try to get the witnesses because they wanted them up front uh and they were denied that and people like collins would say susan collins says let's do it afterwards and then we can vote on it and then we'll see them right which we knew wasn't going to happen right so it gets to the time and all these people who are saying that they're wanting witnesses and they're wanting to hear from these people from here from bolton all just went with the Republicans and said, no, we're going to vote against having any more witnesses. And if you listen to what some of the people were saying, what the Republicans were saying who voted to not have witnesses were like, we understand he did this. Right. So this isn't the message you're going to get from the Fox News and the people like that, because they're going to say um, they voted because it was there was a sham impeachment. There was nothing there. Perfect call, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it um, seemed like it seemed like it, it went from he didn't it, 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 in the the defense, not only overall the uh, entire time, but through the defense with themselves. It was like he didn't do it, but if he did it, he didn't do anything wrong, and he didn't do anything wrong. But if he, like, it was like it, it, we all know he did this. There was a tacit admission, and the fact that none of these witnesses were allowed to testify or give anything kind of tells you what you need yeah. to know. But well, there, there yeah. have been there have been twenty impeachments in the United States. Okay. There were 16 that went to trial. Okay. Right. In 15 of those witnesses were called. Right. The only one that was, they weren't called in was this one. Yeah. I just don't have so, sympathy for them because the house Democrats could have yeah. done it and they didn't fight for it. They wanted they to make fight it for it because it would have taken three years. So by then Trump's out of office possibly. Okay. Right. I mean, that's, that's what they were looking at. That's, that's the calculation they made. They didn't want to sit around and wait. And they already had McGahn on the table to hopefully get through the system and then they could call after it that was determined that he needed to speak, but it's still sitting in the appeals court. It hasn't even gone to that yet to go to the Supreme court. So it's going to be 2022 probably before they even get him to testify. And there comes a time where the courts will then say, well, he's no longer in office or he's like a six months before he goes out of office. You don't have any more standing because it's a moot point. I right, get so then that, they throw but it out. If, if you're, if why not set the legal precedent that, why not break executive privileges back in some ways? That's probably yeah, what they, they have. That's probably what they didn't want to do. No, no, they have because you, you have U.S. versus Nixon. You have what happened with the uh, Obama uh, claim of of um, executive privilege. Trump never even claimed executive privilege, so it's kind of hard to argue against executive privilege that he's never claimed. He just said. I'm not participating. <laughs> I don't think it's valid. Right. So he didn't even have to claim from privilege and nobody's that. calling him on that. Um, and then the, the funniest part too, is that the house, the, 
Trump's lawyers were, were, were defending him saying, you know, they should have gone after these subpoenas because that's where it should be. It should be in the courts to determine whether or not he has to, to pre present this information, which it's been in the courts. It's been decided for 40 years. We know what the, the laws are and what's been cited, but you want to try and play this game, right? So they're saying you need to go to the courts and you need to get this adjudicated. And then you go and look at what they're arguing that same week in the Don McGahn trial, uh, where they're trying to get Don McCann to testify and, and force that subpoena. And Trump's lawyers are saying in that case that the judicial has no say in what's going on between the, the executive and the legislative branch and they should stay out of it. And they give precedent of some Supreme Court decisions that actually back some of that up. So what do you do? You've got, you've got them saying you should go and get it. And then you've got them arguing that you, you have no say here to, to enforce these subpoenas through the courts. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're kind of left in a bit of a quandary there. They don't know, you know, they're trying to argue both sides of that thing. You can't, you can't do that. It doesn't so why, work that way. All right. So let's, uh, let me ask this. Why is everybody pissed at McConnell? What's everybody's pissed at McConnell? What, why, what do you do? Other than just being a complete shill. I mean, I don't know if there's anything specific that he did other than that. Well, everybody's just saying this was a sham trial and we shouldn't, you well, know, yeah. the, the Democrats are mad because it was like a no, sham. No. It's like y'all wouldn't have done anything different if this was a D and you were in McConnell. Like, that's where I well, just. McConnell, McConnell came out and said, I'm going to do whatever the Trump defense team tells, how, tells me how to run this trial. That's how I'm going to run it. Okay. Now, that, that may be what happened in Clinton. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know behind the scenes on that, but he just overtly said it. And then you had all these senators saying, you know, we're, we're supposed to be taking an oath of impartiality and they're coming out saying, yeah, he didn't do it. I'm just I'm going to be acquitted. We should just not even have this trial and they're going to try and vote. I mean, look at what Ron Paul was doing or not Ron, but Rand, uh, Rand Paul was doing right. I mean, Rand Paul was just completely unhinged of this whole thing, which I, I don't, I don't get, I don't understand where he's going with this. I mean, he's, he's trying to get the, um, he's, he's trying to get Roberts to say the suspected whistleblower's name during the trial and getting mad because it didn't happen. And then goes out and goes on the Senate floor and does it anyway himself. Well, it's, why it's does like, he care? Because he thinks that this is all, this proves the whole thing is a conspiracy because the person who reported him to the ICIG was not a Republican. Not, not a Republican. That's pretty, that's come on though. He works in politics and he's not a Republican. What else is he going to be? He's going to be a Democrat in DC working in politics. That's what's going to happen. Who did he work for? He worked for a variety of people. One time, I think one time he worked for Biden. Okay. Thank you. But that doesn't, well, how does, <laughs> it could have been Hillary Clinton who came up with that. The problem was, is that the, what he reported was looked into by the ICIG, found to be credible. Sure. And then we found out that everything he said was exactly true. So but, what no. does it matter? It's like, well, right. we don't go but to why, trial why and call you? into people who called Crime Stoppers and have them come in the, the, to, and, and care who they are. It's the same thing. If, if we have proof that this happened, we have proof this happened, it's immaterial. Who, but like, did, why are you mad at politicians for politicianing? It's like, I'm not mad at the Democrats for making a big deal about the witnesses in the Senate. Like, it just makes me go, I just don't find you credible. It's like when Nancy Pelosi tries, this is a, you know, it's a solemn, I'm the adult in the room. I'm going to make sure that we hold Trump accountable. And then the, the idiot stands up and tears up the speech like a child. Like, these people are not, you know, Adam Schiff going and speaking on, on the weekend after the impeachment begins at a, at a Democratic rally and basically fires up the crowd that he's going to one, the one going to get him removed. Like, yeah, silly uh, stuff. Rand, but Rand, right. But Rand Paul trying to shift the PR conversation is no different than the witnesses and the Democrats. Right. Like, that's but what, what he's trying to do about. is illegal. You know, it's not just right, well, trying to change the PR. He's trying to he's and he was the one wanting to expand whistleblower rules and regulations a couple of years ago. Right. It's 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 amazing to me. And and the other thing about calling the witnesses is that when they when they did it in the house and they tried to call Bolton, Bolton said no. I wanted to go through the courts. So they said, "Ah, oh, we're not going to waste our time." And then they got to the Senate and then Bolton says, "Yeah, I'll testify in the Senate. No problem. You don't have to subpoena me. You just you're you have to ask me, right? You know. Uh, but I'll honor it and I'll come and talk. 
So there was no subpoena fight that was going to happen. It wasn't going to be an extended long uh, battle in the courts while, and us waiting on this to extend it out. He was willing to come down and testify that day. And that's, I think, what was really the frustrating part for a lot of people is that, I mean, 70% of the people wanted to hear what he had to say. I, I totally – listen, I'm, I give you shit, but – it is absolutely insane that none of these witnesses ever testified, like especially John Bolton, because Bolton clearly wants to. Now, part of it is him covering his butt because he's got this book coming out. Oh, yeah. And if he comes out and he puts it all in a book and he goes on a press tour and talks about it, like the natural question is, well, why wouldn't you testify under oath? But you'll put it in a for profit book. Right. And so for him he has to do this. He has to do this and say, I will testify so he can tell his story here because he's going to tell his story in June. Yeah. But at the same time, like the guy was in the rooms, he's a key witness. He wants to testify. He's, it, it didn't make sense that, Ju that Bolton was never called. Like it just, it, and I think that's where it makes people like you mad where you're just like, it's so obvious why right, he right. doesn't want people to testify where he's saying he has the documents, but he won't release the documents. Like it's so obvious that he just, he's part not participating because he knows he's going to give them everything that they want because he violated, he violated his oath of office or he committed extortion or it's very clear that his roadblocks are intentional because he knows he's in trouble. Right. And, and the other thing too, is that it kind of boggles me that, the center still carried his water for him. Yeah. Because we know the truth is going to come out. You know, this is Washington. This is, you don't hide this stuff anymore. Right. You could maybe 200 years ago. And even then it was sketchy because of the J treaty and all that kind of stuff or the ABC thing. And well, it's well, like, to point, point that out. The Mueller investigation was just basically copy and paste of everything that Maggie Haberman wrote at the New York times over the last and Peter Baker, like, if you read the New York Times and the Washington Post over the past two years, you read the Mueller report. You didn't need to read. There were some well, little read, details filled in, but you got the general gist if you just yeah. followed the news. Like, they knew. You read, you read the unredacted part, yeah. Right. There's still stuff that's coming out on the redacted stuff that's getting unredacted that we're finding out that's like, oh. But, you know, well, that's a whole different story. So, um, but, I mean – for someone who just sees Trump doing multiple things that any other president would probably be impeached for. I mean, look what happened to Nixon. And, and maybe it's, maybe it's this, maybe it's cause Nixon uh, had Jim Baker involved in that situation. And he turned, he, he said, he said in an interview years later before he died, he's like, I was defending the president cause I thought this was a witch hunt by the Democrats. And then the more I heard, the more I realized there was something here and I didn't like it. And then he kind of changed over. And I think yeah. that's when everything started changing in the, in the uh, Clinton thing, where it became more of a bipartisan thing. You mean Howard Baker, not Jim Baker, right? Howard Baker. I don't know why I said Jim Baker, but okay. I, I've got. No, I've got I, think, I think that's right. I think, you know, Mitt Romney's the first domino, the only domino to fall. But you, you have a lot more leaks than you start getting, you know, the. Uh, yeah. Richard Shelby's the J, J uh, who's the Southern Senator who finally kind of uh, J Alexander. Alexander you get some, who, yeah, you who start pray, to get, who praise Baker for what he did in, in, and he just kind of roll over and did the other way on it. But the one thing I wanted to bring up too, is that, okay, so we know this is all going to come out. So these people are going to look like fools, the, the senators, because they obviously participated in, in doing everything they could to keep this from getting, a, a uh, removal. So when you look at what these people said too, we've got um, the uh, like Susan Collins and some of the other ones who voted against said, we know that he did this, right? We agree that he did what he did. It is wrong. It is troubling, but we voted to not remove him because we thought that was too harsh of a penalty. So now we're going to go and we're going to hold, we think he got the message, right? So we think he got the message and he won't do this again. So several senators have said something like that. They go to Trump after Susan Collins says this and they ask Trump, did you learn your lesson? He says, I did nothing wrong. It was a perfect call. He didn't right. learn his lesson. They're, they're fooling themselves into a way to kind of straddle through the little 
minefields of politics uh, as they see it and try to therefore, you know, kind of survive all of this without getting hit on the back end of it. And it's not going to happen. If we ignore it, it will go away. Right. And and I saw another, I saw a democratic Senator wrote an op-ed in the post or the times. And they basically said, like, if you talk to Republicans, they just voted because they're afraid of Trump. So like, it, it really raises the question, like, how strong is the Trump movement? How real is it? And how frightening is it to a lot of these guys that they're not willing to buck the party? They're not willing to buck the president. They're not willing to do what Barry Goldwater did and go to the president and say, hey, the four of us are here because we have to switch sides. Like, you're, you're done. So you're going to get impeached tomorrow. And if you resign now, you won't be impeached and that won't be on your record. So, so I, I really wonder how how – how powerful of a movement the Trump movement is going to develop into. I think it's pretty serious. I think it's a pretty serious movement. And I think that it's a pretty devastating movement for American politics. I think I, I have seen the Trump movement and the Trump style of politics. I'm not saying he invented it I'm saying he's just really good at it. And was the person who kind of broke a lot of the most Maorium, if you've read Storm Before the Storm about the fall of the Roman Empire. He's a guy who just doesn't care a lot about the social norms of politics, the political norms, and is willing to break those to maintain his power. And, you know, when the Gracchi brothers did it, it didn't go back. It didn't, it didn't change. And that's a lot of what I was afraid of about Trump in 2016. If you listen to some of those shows, you know, I was in the middle of reading that book and I'm like, guys, Donald Trump is the type of person who doesn't care about the system. And the only thing that really keeps the constitutional system and those checks and balance working is that belief that they exist, right? Like it's why Lysander Spooner is such a dangerous person in his book. No, what is it? No treason. And it's basically an anti-constitutional uh, screed although that has a negative connotation, but if you read no, no authority or no tree, what, what is it called? It's, uh, like just look up Lysander Spooner and and read Lysander Spooner. I'm, I'm blanking on the name of his most famous work, of course. Basically, about how you didn't sign shit. Your name's not on the Constitution. You didn't agree to it. You almost are Jeff. It's a very Jeffersonian, where Jefferson Jefferson basically said every generation should have to rewrite their own Constitution. Right. Everybody, you know, every generation needs to come up with their own form of governance, whereas. You know, the Hamiltonians were like, no, we don't, that's too much. It's people don't care. But, you know, Spooner basically said, you didn't sign this. You're not bound by it. You are a perfectly free individual. Um, My issue is, it's not that I philosophically disagree with uh, any of that. It's that I have to live through the breakdown of these norms. And I want to raise kids in the breakdown of these norms. And the majority of the people around me seem to be absolutely fucking insane and violent and society uh, and society seems to be very tilted towards big government solutions. And so if we start eroding the constitutional Republican system, which seems fairly tilted towards our side of things, what is, does it go towards the Bernie side of things? It's a very yeah. dangerous open water to be in. And, and we have history to show what happens there because that was yeah, what happened in the, in the 20s and 30s, right. right? I mean, they just started eroding the, the limits of the Constitution, and look what we got out of it. You know, we got more government involvement, more control over our lives, more this, more that, just because we aren't pushing back and stopping it, and we aren't saying no to this because people at some level just like being taken care of now. You know, they're kind of getting used to it. So it would be hard for them to go out. Like, it's so easy to know that, well, we're taking care of the, the sick people because we have health, we have universal health care instead of setting up a system where this can be done through voluntary means. Uh, well, that's just too hard. Well, right? Mises, yeah. And Mises had a great article today to cut you off again. Mises had a great article today about the SOTU where basically like the SOTU is just another glaring reminder that default is on the horizon. Like you oh, yeah. can't, how are we going to pay for all this? There's, there's no way. I mean, and it's, and we're just promising more and more and more and we're, we're going to spend more and more. And you, and it's not to the point where like other presidents in the past I've seen where they say, Oh yeah, we're going to do all this spending and then they never do it. 
Right. You know, I mean, Bush promised a lot of things and he never did a, most of it. And Obama promised a lot of things and never did most of it. But I get a feeling that Trump is going to try and do all this stuff through executive order if necessary, just because it will make him look popular, which is the populism part of him. And then wreck the, the everything because of it, wreck the economy because of it in the end time. I mean, he talks about the great economy, but he also doesn't understand that we're kind of edging down in a lot of areas right yeah. now. Like manufacturing is like manufacturing's up. It's like, yeah, not like you think the, it is. Those it's indicators like, that the government lies yeah. about, they were yeah. all up. But if you are a regular person, and I saw Amy Klobuchar say this in, in her, she's like, you know, they talk about the economy, but I talk to people every day who don't feel it. And like, it's not a very hopeful message. It's not what I, the no. speech that I would have written for Amy Klobuchar after Iowa. Like mm -hmm. it was pretty uh, sad, but she's not wrong. Like you look around and you really go, okay, political collapse and economic decay are underway in our society. Like there is a lot of little signs that everybody is squeezed to the max and it's not a Trump thing. It's, it's an economic meltdown that is in slow motion. It's stagflation. It's, it is little signs like the fact that there's record unemployment and service jobs can't keep anybody employed. And so how awful is the service at your Burger King, for instance? You know, yeah. my dad runs a janitorial company. He can't hire anybody. And so he's forced to either start hiring people illegally or just not take jobs and not have a growth in his business because he can't find people to work manual labor jobs. Like it's it really yeah, walking it, the importing of labor when your economy is supposedly expanding is yeah. the worst thing you can do to your economy. You do, you, you put a, a constriction around it to where it will go to a certain point and then stop the, the combined opioid crisis, warehousing of the poor through drug crimes and and an expansion of the the uh, welfare state just makes it impossible for my dad to hire somebody like he did in the 80s and 90s. A in addition to other companies using cheap illegal immigrants. Uh, right. So like there's just like the more I look around, I just go, we are really not a functioning society in a lot of ways that I saw when I was in college. Like I really do think that we don't recognize the slow boil around us and it's 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 depressing it's well, everybody's dazzled by the by the stock market numbers right right the 401k look how much money i'm making in my 401k i was up 25 percent last can, year that could be gone tomorrow yeah right that's not so real saying, cash savings. out my 401k right now who, who saves money these days i mean you used to have i mean my parents grew up they were big in saving money my parents didn't make a lot of money uh it was my dad worked and my mom really didn't for the most part it was mostly just my dad working never made more than like 30,000, 40,000 a year. They have retired and have money and they're still doing good because they saved and they prepared and they did all those things. They didn't rely upon the stock market. And you look what happened in 2008. I mean, when, when the stock market tanked then, everybody lost so much of their, of their savings that they thought they had in their 401k. And now they're trying to get it back. And you're like, oh, we got it all back now. I'm like where you're at, where you were now. Okay, that's great. So now you're getting better and you're getting more money in there, but that could go away again tomorrow just like that. And you can't rely on that. I mean, that's, it's great to have, and you should do it. The 401k things are great and stock market is wonderful for those types of things, but you still have to have some basic savings and income that you need to rely on in case it all goes belly up because and it the, will eventually it, all go belly up. In, in my age bracket, it is a, uh, a point of pride bragging about your FICO score and not about, uh, about the amount of money you've saved. Like what I've saved is private, which is usually nothing. It's code for, I have no savings. I have a 780 FICO score and it's because we're all on the cycle of credit. Like, you know, I just had to buy a car, the car that got the tires stolen, uh, the transmission went out and they were like, it's going to be $4,000 to fix this on this $5,000 car. And I'm like, I'll just go to the dealership. I'll get something new and used. And it's like, all right, I'm on my third time where I'm just rolling in an upside down car into this, like, at what point am I going to get off this cycle? Because it's getting harder and harder. The, the you know, it, it, and so you just go, all right, I need to stop thinking about things in terms of debt and start thinking about, you can make a lot of money. You can make good money and not be wealthy. And, and I think part of the Dave Ramsey revolution in our society is that people recognize that. 
And they recognize that the FICO score is the defining moniker of most people. You know, to what you said, my grandparents, my grandma could stay home and raise the kids. Mm-hmm. My parents had to work. Your mom had to work. She had to go get a second job because inflation made everything tighter. And it was a good economy in the 90s, but mom still had to work to pay for sh- stuff. In our generation, two jobs, a two-income household in a lot of ways, even in the middle class, isn't enough. And so now you have the rise of MLMs, side businesses, side hustles. That is really, truly why you have so many friends trying to sell MLM stuff, right? Yeah, some people, to get, some yeah, people do make, yeah, some people genuinely do make a good living at it. Um, and, and that's their job. But for the vast majority of people, it's like their side hustle where you have marketing people, their side hustle and they're on LinkedIn and, and all that, you know? Yeah. I know people so, who had, they buy property and they rent it out because that's how they yeah. make a little bit extra cash on the side because they need the extra money to pay for stuff. And so, it's just so, like, and, and you have to ask yourself why. And it's like, because I need to measure my self-worth and what I can buy and how good my stuff is compared to other people. And again, that tribalism stretches you financially instead of opting out and doing what somebody like Harry does, which is he's the dude is just rolling in cash. Like he's the richest person I know probably. And he works a regular job because he's so, you know, the boss hog is always on about Dave Ramsey and like, you need to do this. And I'm like, I, well, I agree with you now. I'm, I'm with my you. Dad, yeah. My dad told me something a long time ago that I did not listen to at the time. And that was, you have to stop paying people to use your own money. Yes. Right. To borrow money. You're, you're paying people the privilege of spending money ahead of when you've saved it. And if you go look, like I, I remember at the time I was trying to buy this new car. I bought this new car and I had this you know, loan. If you look down at the bottom of the loan, they tell you what your ultimate payment for that car is going to be. And it's usually three times what you're paying for it. Right. That's all interest. It's all money you're giving to someone else for the benefit of not having to take the time to save the money up to go buy the car outright. I right. do. I, I paid off my cars. And I haven't bought a new car on, on credit for 15 years sure. because I'm done with that. I'm done giving people my money to, you know, even, even when I do credit cards, cause sometimes it's easy to do credit cards. I got like an Amazon card. I get 5% on purchases, you know, credit back, which is great. Then I pay the monthly bill. I don't let it ride and just pay interest rates for the, for the privilege of having money sitting, virtual money sitting on this card. Right. right. It's, it's silliness. That's why I don't care about my FICA score for the most part, because I don't go get credit. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to do that anymore. So it, it's just, a, it's a great lesson to learn because I, I see so many people just living through that cycle and, never ever having like a real, I mean, the, the interest rates are so low nowadays, it's almost impossible to make money on just the savings or you have right. to go like the CDs to get anywhere near close to what we used to get on savings accounts. I mean, we had it, interest rates were in the 18% or 15%. You could get four or 5% savings accounts, right? Cause they wanted the money in the bank. So they would pay people to put their money in the bank and they would pay you back so they could loan it out to other people. That's how the savings worked and people were able to make money and plan for the future with real money, right? For savings. And yeah. and now you can only do it through stock market and it's scary because it can go away. All right. I'm going to ask you one last question because I really have to pee, <laughs> but what, what, what else about impeachment has like been, you just I like, I got to say this on the show. What, what have we not um, covered that you just really needed to say about impeachment? I think we covered I, it, most it, of it. It may, it may be the last time we ever talk about it. Right. And, and it probably should be because it's, it's just annoying um, on both sides of the aisle about all of this. But um, really the thing about impeachment is that, that, that I wanted to get off my chest is that I, I, everybody's worried that it's going to be happen too much. That we're going to impeach the president all the time. Uh, every president's going to be impeached twice, three times, whatever, because we've set this precedent. And I don't think that's true. Um, we we impeached Clinton, uh, which is probably kind of something that should or should not have been an impeachment. And we got uh, now with Trump. Trump had to actually go out and do a lot of crazy stuff in order for something to stick for an impeachment. People are scared to death to go through that process. They don't want to go through it. Um, it doesn't really help anybody politically. So 
I would, but I would rather see every president getting impeached or, or at least any president who oversteps their boundaries in any way, they need to be smacked down in some way. Now the Senate says they have ways of doing this that aren't impeachment where they could say, we're going to, we're going to put a hold on uh, doing things for you. We're going to block your attempts to do anything until you stop doing what you're doing. Right. So they, they say they have this mechanism, but they don't use it. They don't utilize it. So the presidents just keep getting more power and power. So, um, and they slowly step over the line. Now back in uh, when Nixon was, was impeached and he wasn't actually impeached, but he was going to be impeached and he resigned. Ford really did hardly anything even remotely close to being across the line. Carter didn't do anything remotely close to being across the line, right? So they, they were kind of keeping themselves in check. And then, you know, Reagan came in and, and kind of pushed some boundaries and got away with it because he was popular. And then you know, Bush did some things that, that uh, weren't popular. And then, and then, you know, Clinton did his stuff. And then Bush Jr. did his, I mean, every, every one of them kept pushing and furthering and going beyond what they were supposed to be doing and Congress just kept letting it happen and letting it happen. And that's where we got to the point where now we have a president who basically just says, I can do whatever I want. He said that if I do it, it's not illegal, which is what Nixon's famous quote was back in 1970, right? right. 1973. So I'm, if, if the president does it, it's not illegal. Or did he say that during the Frost, Frost interview, maybe? It was um, Frost. That, I believe it was Frost. Yeah. It was the Frost interviews after. If the, the president uh, doesn't, it's, it's not illegal. And everybody's like, <laughs> but, what the fuck did but he that's say? what he thought. You could, you could listen to those old tapes now that they're released, and, and he really believed that. And, well, that, and that's Trump kind of was doing the, the same thing. Yeah, it's kind of vice. That the movie where Cheney's theory of unified government, you know, basically is the same thing where the presidency is the law, you know, and so it's an imperial presidency, yeah. Right. If you can, at this point, remove him for – obviously <laughs> extorting another country for propaganda Tape purposes. It. <laughs> it's like even something that obvious and basic, we can't do anything. I mean, it, all the president has to do is get enough senators in his pocket and he never has to worry about impeachment. How many removals have we ever had in this country for the president? None. Right. None have ever been removed through impeachment. Right. And that's because they set such a high bar for actually having it happen that it just politically is going to be nearly impossible to do. Somebody has to do something completely outrageous. And even then, I don't know. I mean, in this climate, right. I really don't know. But I mean, there have been other impeachments in the country, right? So there's been 20 impeachments. So we, we, that process functions for certain things, but it doesn't seem to work for the president because we've invested too much power there. And everybody wants that power. So nobody wants to tell them that they can't have that power because they think that they're next. They're, they're the next ones up to get a hold of that, and then they can do what they want. So guess what's going to happen next, the next time there's a new president? You know, it'll probably be a Democrat. I'm not saying 2020 or 2024. I don't know when it's going to be. Uh, I have my suspicions, and we'll see how things go. But the next Democrat's going to come in and go, okay, now we're going to do the new Green Deal. I'm doing the executive order. I don't care what Congress says. I'm going to do all this stuff now for uh, taking gun rights away because well, I don't care what any of this stuff. And you can't stop me because I have enough senators in my pocket that I can't be removed. Yeah. That's going to happen. We, we've given the precedent up, and it's there now. And, and that's – we've got to find some way to fight back or we just admit that we now have an imperial presidency. And we're seeing the, they're seeing the same things that the, the Roman Empire found, saw with the dissolution of Congress and the, and the imperial basically monarchy that they were putting in place for that. Now, it, we're seeing the signs of it. I, I hope we don't get there. I'd like to see people finally wake up and say no, but we're seeing the beginnings of that. I, think Americans, think, I think Americans think that they can't get there. I think that they, yeah. their own hubris does not allow them to see the signs. And, 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 and every society goes through that, but – um, yeah, there's another great book out there called The Five Stages of Collapse uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then Reinventing Collapse by the same author, Dmitry something, who was in Russia and basically outlined their collapse and basically says, like, here's how America is becoming a failing state. And you go, uh-oh. <laughs> so, uh, all right, we got to wrap up. This really has been an old school episode of Wall. We used to do three-hour episodes easy. You know, seven topics five people, three and a half hours, no 
outline, no show notes, barely prepared. Let's sit down. And we and did it with, and this. we did it with just two of us. That's the, just two. We're chatting. That's how great we are. Yeah, I mean, so you old school wall fans from the old 2014 days, you got, you guys are just ecstatic right now. Uh, so, all right, thanks everybody for listening to the show. Final thoughts, Reinhold. Uh, nothing really. Uh, just glad everybody listened, and please. Uh, Come back and hear us again. If you like what you heard, subscribe. Let us know, let somebody else know. Um, get us out there so that other people can hear us and, and hear the messages that we that they need to hear. Yep. Thank you to Reinhold for being flexible um, because no I, I texted him like five minutes before we were supposed to do the show last night. I was like, listen, uh, this Iowa thing's still evolving. We just got the numbers. So too is tonight. I didn't know impeachment would be done today. And I'm just like, hey, uh, can we do the show tomorrow? And he's like, sure, no problem. And then I was like, hey, so he's always flexible. He and Harry are always flexible with me. I get, I just get tired and I don't want to do a bad show for you. So, you know, sometimes it's like if we can do it the next day then better, uh, better for you. So thank you to him for being flexible. Thank you to you for listening. Please go, go join our social media. Uh, I never promote really anything we do on the show, which is so stupid of me because I coach people to do podcasts now. And I'm always like, you need to refresh and you need to do this. And I never do on my own show all the stuff that I teach other people to do. Um, but we have something called the Libertarian Aurora. That is a daily email. Uh, sign up for our email list. We'll send that to you every morning. It's really a cool site. Go to libertarianaurora.com and you'll see why we named it that. And it's a daily summation of s uh, several hundred news articles from a libertarian perspective. I think you're going to really like it. I've worked hard to kind of curate this in the right way. And, uh, and we send it out to you in an email blast every day. Um, because you guys have listened two and a half hours, I'm going to tell you the truth. You deserve the truth, listener. You get this email blast whenever I poop. Because <laughs> I put it together. Uh, I get the, it auto-generates. I go through. I delete what I don't want. I ship it over to the MailChimp, and I send it out. And... Just when I have some sitting time in the morning is when I put it together. So every time you get that, no, that's what was happening when you open that newsletter. So thank you so much for watching. I, I don't know how I'm ever, Reinhold, going to be a professional with this level of honesty with the audience. That I'd, you don't hear Tom Brokaw going on, on his show going, you know, when I put that email newsletter together, I was doing a grumpy. <laughs> but here we are. Uh, all right. Thanks so much for listening. Go join the email newsletter and I promise it is smell free. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next week.